a minute or two Audio needs to get. Audio need. Who is audio need? Okay, once again, welcome to all at the onset. I really thank you all for sparing this precious time on a busy Sunday. That is the time you should relax. At the onset, I really thank Dr. Namrata Sharma. You can you can see her everywhere. How she does all this is another class to be full time class to be given to everyone. Manage your time, manage your talks. and teach everyone who comes across madam you are always wanted everywhere thank you for this and that was a request i was asked when you last came to us on a meeting i reflect to decoded ask sir ask dr namar sharma to be with us again and you are once again here with us thank you very much for sparing time i welcome dr samira samira has been our honored guest always part of us part of the punjab salmic society do living across the border what she really teaches a lot through the messages through the whatsapp group she has created and shows strict she is on the group you can't post anything that's good madam that's a good criteria i think you need a check on every group you put up or begin with it's a wonderful group teaching basics probably we don't get teachers to teach us basics complications we create we learn but basics we forget from dr samira i can't thank dr manju he is a busy man he looks always so young energetic i won't see say the next word madam jyoti is there but he is a wonderful teacher cannot be a greater surgeon than him the way he teaches he makes you connect with the patient it's only when your students remember you himanshu you learn how great you have taught them welcome welcome dr jyoti medalia thank you very much for sparing time for us if at all you happen to see her videos presented at international conferences you will be delighted and you won't miss to stand and clap we have seen a wonderful videos of optic nerve
the compensations praised by everyone won laurels and awards everywhere wherever she went welcome and we are lucky and it's a pleasure to have you with us today thank you if i not miss my team from pos our general secretary ashwini our president shakin singh our mastermind brain behind us dr p s brad he is always with us he has been attending webinar since morning but did spare time for this place thank you dr brad and we have with us team from our own city the pos dr rana has not checked in dr dinesh gurg dr neeraj shafi love you bade be with us always and uh, prenka you will create the busy discussions with us and we are waiting for dr vikas mittal and sahil goel dr jain how could i miss you i wanted to speak for with you for you in the last he is he is a friend he is so close to us that you don't need even to call him he should get a message he is there for you always helping you and a wonderful talk a teacher par excellence of course now he is going to a great job he had the cornea unit and we have solved many of our cornea problems through him thank you being sharing us always all the time you always gave us dinesh dinesh is again good evening sir all do a retina man is more of an nta segment now thank you for thank you very much for being with us thank you and sir and of, of course my clicks we have our young speaker dr sachri siddhu madam jyoti mitali you sent a wonderful team to my hospital there is only one discussion going in my opd whether it is nimrata or sachri it's about dr himanshu or dr jyoti mitalia thank you for giving such a knowledge to the these students they are doing wonderful and i am not missing i don't want to miss our dynamic ex general secretary of pos nilima sodi she will rank she will make you see that she is present here she will make you vibrant all through dr vinda thank you sparing so much of time though the subject is beyond you but she has been part of us always she started her career as a cornea person landed into posterior segment and then matured to be such a active surgeon that's her appointments have yet to be waited in vitro retinal surgery before spending more time i have not missed anything missed anyone except those who have joined we start with the first speaker abhinav will you introduce dr namrata sharma please i agree with you everyone i think if one takes a closer look at the alchemy of the next speaker you see two distinct virtues pop up one is perseverance and another is hard work so it gives me great pleasure to introduce dr namrata sharma the honorary secretary to aios i think he is a pioneer in clinical researcher in both cataract refractive ocular Uh, surgical reconstructive sur um, anterior segment reconstructive sur procedures ocular surface surgeries and care of faces and uh, it's an immense pleasure for us to invite her here and please ma'am i ask you to proceed with your talk on the, the microbial keratitis and customized competent surgery for cornea what the number tha Thank you, Abhinav. I'll just share my slides for. So, Doctor Sudhir, को यारो mail कर दे. Are the are the slides sharing? I think they are sharing. So I would be talking to you about algorithm for recalcitrant microbial keratitis, and. Uh, there are no financial or proprietary interests or disclosures 
Uh, bacterial keratitis, uh, it could be microbial keratitis, essentially could be bacterial, viral, fungal, and parasitic. And bacterial and fungal keratitis are the most common ones which we all encounter. And this is a classical case of uh, Pseudomonas keratitis with a greenish, yellowish uh, discharge and a perforated corneal ulcer. So whenever a case of microbial keratitis comes, it's important to know, to take a good history and important to know what is the size of the ulcer, whether it is mild, moderate, or severe. So if it is uh, less than two millimeters in size, less than 20%, it is superficial like this. If it is moderate, then it is two to five, 20 to 50% like this. And if it is severe, then it is more than five, more than 50%, something looking like this. Now it is important because that is going to determine your treatment, especially for bacterial and fungal microbial keratitis. And sometimes you can pick up the diagnosis when you look at the ulcer. So this, this ulcer, staph ulcers tend to be localized punched out ulcers with the surrounding cornea, which is quite clear. And pneumococcal, on the other hand, tend to be rapidly progressive with serpiginous ulcers, folds, desmets membrane, hypopion, deep stromal uh, abscess. Then pseudomonas ulcers, on the other hand, like I discussed previously, would be fulminant with greenish yellowish discharge, infiltration within 24 hours, ring ulcer in 48 to 96 hours, desmetoseal perforation within two to five days. Mycobacteria uh, ulcers, on the other hand, have a cracked windshield-like appearance. As you can see here, this is cracked windshield with the surrounding cornea, which is quite clear, and there's hardly any AC reaction which is present. So this is a cracked windshield-like appearance. And Morexella ulcers, classically, you will see they are inferior, they are oval, uh, they are, there's hardly any AC reaction which is present. And uh, sometimes they have a uh, Nucardia ulcers, on the other hand, have a wreath-like pattern with elevated hyphate edges and satellite lesions. Now, the mainstay for a case of microbial keratitis is corneal scrapes. One should avoid cotton swabs because fatty acids have inhibitory effect. Proparacaine can be used uh, because that is uh, uh, least bactericidal. And scraping should be done from the leading edge of the ulcer as well as from the center. And the modified Kimura spatula can be used to get the uh, scrape. Although we can also use a, a blade, a 15 degrees scalpel blade is good enough. Then the most important stain for a case of microbial keratitis is KOH. So on KOH, if you pick up the fungal hyphae, then you know that you can start the antifungal therapy. Otherwise, you have to uh, continue with the empirical bacterial therapy. And the, by, the scrapes have to be sent onto blood agar, chocolate agar, subroots, dextrose agar, depending on the type of the uh, organism that you're looking at. But essentially, we do send to these three and supplemental media like anaerobic blood agar, LJ media, non-nutrient agar with E. coli in cases of recalcitrant ulcers. Now, anything which is associated with the ulcer, with whether it's a suture or it is contact lens, contact lens solution, contact lens case, everything goes in for culture sensitivity. And for cases of bacterial keratitis, the rate is 40 to 73%. And in cases with at least twice negative smear in culture, non, no clinical improvement, a partial thickness trephination can be done and tissue can be removed in block and it can be bisected and sent for biopsy. So when you have mild ulcers, which are less than three millimeters in size, not involving the visual, like, yeah, one has to start with the monotherapy, which could be a gatiflox 0.3% or 0.5% or moxiflox 0.5% or levoflox 1.3%, 1.5%. However, if there are moderate ulcers, which are more than three millimeters in size, which involve the visual axis, then we like to start combination therapy, fortified kefazolin 5%. Victobromycin 1.3% to cover for both the gram positive cocci as well as the gram negative uh, uh, bacilli. And generally, this loading dose is given round the clock for eight hours and then you assess the clinical response. So, uh, for a bacterial keratitis, if the response is occurring within 48 hours, you say it is responding. However, for a fungal keratitis, it may take about four to seven days to respond. These are our two papers which looked at uh, monotherapy versus combination therapy, randomized control trials. Each of these two papers looked at 220 plus patients. And we found that in mild to moderate corneal ulcers, fluoroquinolone alone is uh, helpful to treat bacterial therapy. Adjunctive therapy continues in the form of cycloplegics, anti-glaucoma medications, and systemic antibiotics can be given in perforations, impending perforations, post-perforating injury, scleral involvement and when the organism is Neisseria and Haemophilus because these can penetrate an intact epithelium. Topical steroids can be started in a case of bacterial keratitis provided you have a culture sensitivity report in hand and provided you've already loaded the ulcer with uh, antibiotics at least for 48 hours. 
Now, what did this CUT trial, that is the steroid corneal ulcer trial, uh, teach us? Uh, topical steroids may be started. Uh, like I said, loading dose of antibiotics have to be given for 48 hours and culture sensitivity report should be in hand. And steroids should never be started for these th three things. And it is easy to remember, no cardiac keratitis, atypical mycobacteria keratitis, and fungal keratitis. So if you are absolutely sure that this is not the diagnosis, then one can start the microbial steroids provided the first two, uh, first two conditions are clear. That is loading dose of antibiotics for 48 hours and culture and sensitivity report is in hand. Now, uh, to say that a clinical response is occurring, the favorable signs are decrease in area, density of infiltration, epithelial healing, and AC reaction, which would decrease. However, if the ulcers are not healing after 48 hours, then you know that there could be issues, such as issues of compliance, resistance, other organisms which you are missing, like atypical bacteria, herpes, fungus, protozoa, and other factors which are not taken care of, like dry eye, vitamin A deficiency, and exposure. Now, modify antibiotics only if there is no clinical improvement. If the culture sensitivity report says otherwise and the patient is clinically responding, change nothing about it. But if the response is not there and the culture sensitivity says otherwise, then you should change the antibiotic. And antibiotics in general should be just stop short. Try not to taper the antibiotics because when you taper the antibiotics, then the chances of resistance for uh, bacterial keratitis would increase. Now, specific antibiotics have to be given for specific organisms. For instance, MRSA, vancomycin uh, should be given, severe pseudomonas keratitis, septazidine, mycobacterium, fortitum, chelone, and nocardia, amikacin can be given along with trimethoprim. Uh, in cases which are not responding, sometimes we have to constitute this tropical cholestin 0.19%. And this is just to show how this is made. Uh, when you know that it is bacteria and it is resistant to chloroquinolones and resistant to all the antibacterial drugs, then this can be one option. So at every stage, it is important to either draw a diagram or to capture a picture and always do a fluorescein staining because the size of the epithelial defect may be different from the size of the uh, infiltrate. And at every point in time, you have to monitor not only the size of the infiltrate, but also the epithelial defect. Then there can be sequel. The sequel could be in the form of perforation, impending perforation, desmatocele, uh, uh, corneal scars, uh, adherent leukomas, et cetera, depending upon the complications. Coming to the second type of uh, microbial keratitis that is common in our country, that is aspergillus keratitis, which is more common in North and West India, and fusarium keratitis, which is more common in South and East India. For every case of microbial keratitis, or for that matter, any kind of infection, it is important to know where geographically you are located, because some of the organisms have predilection for certain uh, geographical areas. Certain uh, fungal fungi will have uh, features such as this brown pigmentation, which will be seen in dermatitious fungi. Fusarium, on the other hand, tends to have a more severe course with deep extension and perforation and each shows a color bot button, uh, color button configuration. When, in, when you treat a case of dermatitious fungal keratitis with natamycin, then this is how uh, it, it responds. The pigmentation is the first thing which would disappear on therapy. Again, 10% KOH has to be done and cultures have to be sent on subroach dextrose agar, just as uh, we discussed previously. And in cases which are appearing to be of uh, fungal keratitis, but the Microbiology doesn't support it. You can either do PCR or you can do confocal microscopy. And if you pick up hyphae on these two tests, then also you can start antifungal therapy. We did a study on spectral domain anterior segment OCT in cases of fungal keratitis. And we could pick up features on the anterior segment OCT, which are indicative of the activity of the uh, fungal ulcers, which include the uh, increased amount of uh, reflectivity of the keratocytes as well as the breach that can be seen here. And this is discussed in detail in the paper, uh, which is shown here. The mainstay for a um, case of fungal keratitis is 5% natamycin hourly, which is given during the daytime, two hourly at bedtime. And unlike for a case of bacterial keratitis, fungal keratitis takes longer to respond. So it will take four to seven days interval before you can say that your drugs are working or not working. And generally, the bacterial keratitis will, would resolve in about 14 days time, but 
fungal keratitis would take about a month's time. This is a case which responded to topical natamycin, fusarium keratitis, and topical antifungal therapy, which is currently commercially available, has poor ocular penetration, which includes natamycin, poor bioavailability and toxicity issues. Systemic antifungal agents have been used in the past for large ulcers, severe deep keratitis, scleritis, post-PK and endophthalmitis. And the drugs commonly used are ketoconazole or voriconazole 200 milligrams BD. LFT, of course, has to be done every two weeks in these cases. This is just to show a case which did not heal on topical natamycin. And when we added systemic ketoconazole was due to fusarium, it led to the formation of a scar. This was another case, a tunnel fungal infection which was not uh, getting uh, treated by topical voriconazole alone. So when systemic was added, the, uh, it caused the healing of the uh, tunnel infection. Now the MUD2 trial uh, did tell us that uh, uh, oral voriconazole, when you, uh, when you uh, compare oral voriconazole with oral placebo, uh, fusarium keratitis may benefit from the addition of oral voriconazole to topical natamycin. And we did a study because some of the patients are able to afford oral ketoconazole and not oral voriconazole. So we wanted to compare these two and we did a study we found in terms of healing, there was no difference at all. But in terms of tear film and serum concentration, voriconazole concentrations were found to be much higher. So we concluded that you could give uh, ketoconazole in those patients who, uh, do not, uh, who are not able to afford it. Uh, however, in patients who are able to afford the therapy, voriconazole should be given. Now, targeted drug delivery has a role to play in fungal keratitis because of the nature at which the lesion is situated and intrakameral antifungal injections are indicated for cases of thick hypopion with endothelial exudates, deep anterior chamber exudates. And we nowadays give voriconazole 50 to 100 micrograms per 0.1 ml. And this is a case which has responded to intracameral amphotericin B. Then intrastomal injections, on the other hand, are given for deep mycotic keratitis, non-perforated corneal ulcers, not responsive to conventional topical and systemic antifungal therapy for four weeks. This was our very first case in which we tried intrastomal injections. This case was going for therapeutic keratoplasty, and we just thought that before taking this patient for therapeutic keratoplasty, let's try intrastomal injections. And this was the resolution with intrastomal boriconazole, and that is why uh, we have we have now started using intrastomal injections in our armamentarium. Subsequently, in 2008, we published three such cases, and then we also did a randomized control trial to see whether intrastomal is better than topical voriconazole. And we found that when in cases where you added topical voriconazole to topical natamycin, they did well. But when you compared the combination therapy of topical voriconazole with topical natamycin, vis a vis with intrastomal voriconazole, we did not find a difference. So these are two of our cases from that study which have responded to therapy and other two cases of uh, topical natamycin with intrastomal voriconazole which have responded. And this is how uh, generally it is given. So a uh, 30 gauge needle uh, can be taken and uh, the uh, lesions are uh, covered just as you do in a case of a macular grid all around. These are two satellite lesions, so the reflex is very much akin to the uh, phaco wound reflex, the hydration reflex, and the idea is that all around the lesion a barrage is uh, formed so that uh, the uh, ulcers, they heal and there is good bioavailability of the drug at the site of the lesion. And this is another one, sometimes you have to give both intracameral and intrastromal, so AC paracentesis is done. This is uh, followed by washing of the exudates. After washing, the intracameral voriconazole is instilled, and then subsequently, intrastomal voriconazole is injected in five to six hemimeridians, again forming a barrage very much uh, like you do for a macular grid. And uh, this is how it looks at the end of the surgery. So, this is uh, what we propose the TST protocol, the topical, systemic, and the targeted therapy for fungal keratitis. So, if the ulcer is less than five millimeter in size less than 50% stroma involvement, start topical natamycin. If there is no response, it is well and good. If there is a response, it is well and good. If there's no response, you add topical voriconazole. However, if the ulcer size is large or is at a greater depth, you have to start systemic uh, drugs along with the topical drugs. And if there is no response for two weeks, then add topical voriconazole to it. If there's no response for four weeks, then come to the targeted form. 
which could be intracameral, intrastromal, or both, depending upon where the lesion is. So this is uh, what we published, and this was uh, the study, the number of cases that we had, and we looked at, and uh, the response was quite good. So this is the paper in detail of the same. We are, we've now uh, made this, we are talking to Sun Pharma and to Elmet to make this water-soluble natamycin, which is linked to a polymer so that it becomes water-soluble with good kinetics. The peak values are higher than the natamycin uh, alone. And this is one case of post lethal fusarium where intrastromal natasol is given and it is okay. And sometimes you need a multi-pronged attack. So you've done a therapeutic keratoplasty. Still, there is a ulcer which is up happening uh, in, in a graft and then you give intrastromal injections and these are two of our publications for operations after microbial keratitis so those who want to read in detail can read from survey of ophthalmology and current opinions in ophthalmology in our book on corneal ulcers and thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Dr. Namarta, for a wonderful talk. I think it clears everything. Everyone, privately practicing ophthalmologist, needs to be reminded all this, all talks you give and virtually recorded and to be given to them always. I think you can continue with your second talk. Uh, Nabu? Ma'am, are you going to continue with your second talk, please? Yes, I'm just uh, sharing the screen. Okay. So the second talk is a little uh, out of place now for corneal surgeons because uh, for the simple reason that uh, the uh, Corneal transplantation is not happening. So only limited uh, type of uh, hospital corneal retrieval program has been allowed by the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare. But nevertheless, it is important whenever we resume it. So uh, I would be talking to you about component surgery of cornea. And again, there are no financial or proprietary interests. Now, corneal transplantation full thickness is a familiar technique with us for last almost 115 years. We are familiar with it. We are also familiar with the problems that can arise as a result of this uh, keratoplasty, which includes long post-op visual recovery, ocular surface problems, graft rejection, increased chances of wound rupture after trivial trauma, change in anatomy of the eye, then infections because of the sutures that are present, vascularization, high astigmatism, then epithelial defects, graft infection, and end of thalmitis. And sometimes when your graft is also clear, you still have a problem of astigmatism, so the patients don't see well. And of course, this is the most ominous complication that can occur in a full thickness uh, uh, graft, and that is uh, the expulsive hemorrhage. And uh, uh, you see that the retinal contents, intraocular contents, etc., et all are extruding out, followed by a massive expulsive hemorrhage. So this is a problem with the full thickness graft. So we moved from an older era of overkill therapeutics where we just did PK and LK to a more customized approach. So each of the layers is uh, replaced so you can do uh, uh, manual lk or altk for anterior corneal opacities dalk for mid to posterior corneal stromal opacities and dsec or dmec for diseased desmets membrane and endothelium and the uh, the uh, credit for these surgeries developing these surgeries goes to these uh, gentlemen here each of whom have contributed to the evolution of these surgeries now, uh, earlier we used to do manual dissection and there used to be a lot of irregularities which used to be there, uh, which also showed in the post-op pictures. So we moved into the automated microkeratome, very much uh, uh, inspired by our uh, uh, LASIK surgeons. And it is technically easy, less time consuming with smooth host donor cut with thickness, which is nearly exact and no interface problems and can be done for conditions like this keratoconus, ferroidal degeneration, granular dystrophy, Salzman nodular degeneration. And for any, uh, okay, so this is not playing, the media cannot be found. So basically what is done in this case is that the uh, 350 microns of the cornea is taken and uh, it is then sutured onto the keratoconic cornea from which the 250 microns is, uh, is removed and uh, uh, 
replaced by a healthy cornea and sutured with tenjiro monofilament nylon sutures. So there is an interface which is present there, but this interface is quite clear and it is not irregular. And these are the results of uh, automated lamellar therapeutic uh, keratoplasty in various indications. The uh, uh, astigmatism is less than four diopters with the good results, best corrected visual acuity ranging from 70 to uh, 70 to 94%. Again, this is not plain. So anyway, uh, we come move deeper and that is deep anterior lamellar keratoplasty. It, it has uh, advantage of maximal removal of the diseased tissue. The desmets membrane is a smooth graft bed and virtually there is no interface uh, present. And again, it is indicated for various indications which includes uh, ectasias, which could be due to any reason, stromal dystrophies, ocular surface disorders, and desmetoceles. And of course, we are doing in healed high drops, but for people who are learning or who are still in their learning curve, it should be avoided. And uh, the very fact that Dr. Dua has described Dua's layer has made things uh, easy for us as far as the DALC is concerned. So Dua's layer is nothing but it is the condensation of the stromal keratocytes just above the desmets membrane. And uh, uh, this helps us to form two types of bubble, the type one bubble, which shows you the rough surface and the type two bubble, which is smooth. So type one bubble is between Dua's layer and stroma and type two bubble is between Dua's layer and Desmet's membrane. So just to show you the surgery, this is what a type one big bubble DAL uh, looks like. So after doing a partial thickness trephination, which is almost 60 to 70% depth, a needle is used to create a big bubble. And you can see that the Desmet's membrane has fallen back. And just as you give a nick on the overlying stromal layers, the uh, air egresses out of this. And you can actually see the Desmet's membrane, which is marching towards the uh, stromal layers because the air is egressing out. So you are still extraocular. The Desmet's membrane is very much intact. And everything is occurring on the surface of the cornea without having to enter the anterior chamber. And again, viscoelastic is then injected inside and the overlying stromal layers are again split with the help of the Vana scissors. You can see that there's an intact Desmet's membrane which is present and a full thickness donor cornea is then taken and sutured with 10 monofilament nylon sutures. So this is how uh, it looks like a Hurler's she syndrome patient, uh, almost now 12 years follow up, 6, 9 and 6, 12, extraocular procedure, DAL. We've not entered the anterior chamber, still doing very well. And uh, this is the beauty of uh, DALC, that there are no intraocular complications which are related with it at all. Even in cases of desmetoseal, it is very useful. You can just uh, put a viscoelastic agent from the edges of the desmetoseal and can just strip the desmetoseal. And this is again the bare desmets membrane, which is looking at you, wherein the suturing of the graft is done. And this is the post-op picture, which again, uh, in a single stage, you've not only uh, treated the uh, 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 visually rehabilitated the patient as well as uh, taken care of this desmetoseal which is there. Then in cases of kerat keratoglobus, we've described a surgery which is called as tuck in lamellar keratoplasty. And uh, basically uh, this is the technique. Okay, so I'll have to explain it because these are not playing now. So basically this is the technique in which you have a central part which is lamellar and a peripheral flange all around. So this goes and it is sits into the onto the surface in such a manner because the periphery is thinned out. So you just tuck this flange inside here in the periphery to reinforce it. And likewise for uh, Tyrion's marginal degeneration, it is done only in one side because uh, in, uh, superiorly and in Pellucid, it is done uh, uh, on one side only, whichever part is thinned out. So there's a partial flange only which is present. This is not playing. Again, this is not, the movies are creating a problem anyway. So this is the post-op picture. You can see that the periphery is very much uh, thinned out. And now we come to the posterior lamellar keratoplasties. So with DSEC, you replace the, with the desmet uh, stroma as well as endothelium. And with DMEC, only the physiological uh, graft. And there are no sutures which are present. Of course, it is done for cases which have corneal decompensation. And the visual rehabilitation takes three months as opposed to 12 months after a full thickness penetrating keratoplasty. So for these procedures, for these eyes, one can do a DSEC procedure. And where you, wherever you have a stromal scarring, you cannot do a DSEC procedure. And again, I think the videos is going to be a problem. So suffice it to say that when you 
cut this cornea into 350 microns and split it into 150 microns. The 150 microns is the one which is taken to uh, do a DSEC. And there are several ways uh, in which this endothelium uh, stromal complex, which is 150 microns, can be injected inside the anterior chamber. And this is just one case of fixed dystrophy from which the uh, hypertrophic epithelium is removed. Then uh, subsequently, the uh, Desmet's membrane, which is scarred, is there. So we've done an epithelioraxis. Now we are doing a desmetorexis. And because there was a cataract which was present, so we've done an anterior capsulorexis. And then subsequently, phaco emulsification is done. Foldable intraocular lens implantation is done. And then this graft is taken, which has a healthy endothelium and Desmet's membrane, and pulled intracamerally and is centered and is, gets stuck to the back of the cornea. So this is the post-op picture. So you didn't have to put any sutures. The case was referred for full thickness penetrating keratoplasty, and we could manage it with a with a DSEC graft with a visual acuity of six twelve. Now almost seven years after follow-up is doing very well. And of course, this is true to show the same on an intra-op OC3 microscope. When your graft goes inside, you can see that you know there is gap or space present there. When you put the air bubble, the graft gets stuck to the back of the cornea. And uh, this is how it looks like in the post-operative period. So one cornea can be used for three patients. And I think Dr. Uh, Jain uh, will be talking about this, so I will not delve into it. And uh, this is the most physiological graft, which is the DMEC graft. So the Desmet's membrane is uh, removed from all sides after staining it with the tripan blue dye and sub subsequently is laid back. And trephination is then done. The peripheral part is removed. And this is the pure Desmet's membrane roll, which is there. Now, subsequently, when uh, you do a DMEC, this is the disease Desmet's membrane of a case of fixed dystrophy, which is being removed. And then a pure Desmet's membrane roll is taken, is then injected intracamerally inside, is centered. And when the correct configuration is up with the biceps curls upward, so this is the correct configuration with the biceps curls upwards, then you can just tuck it to the back of the cornea and you can hardly make out that there was ever, ever a graft, you know, which is there. So this is the post-op picture, visual acuity of six by six at week one. And this is at month one, you can't make out that there is, there is a graft which is sitting there. So this again, I'll skip. This was just to show that one cornea can be used for DAL, can be make both. And uh, subsequently, I would just like to show this last movie, which is corneal bioengineering. So with the help of the femtosecond laser, a pocket is created. And uh, this is a keratoconic cornea. This is a bioengineered synthetic uh, cornea, which is taken, which is folded, is then placed inside the pocket, which was uh, created before. And subsequently, uh, this is then unfolded inside and a bandage contact lens is put. One can even do uh, collagen cross-linking after this to cause cross-linking of the cornea. So this is how it looks like post-op day one, and this thins down over a period of time. So this is to say how these uh, surgeries uh, compare. As compared to the uh, uh, graft rejection, you can see is much less with the DMEC, and uh, as compared to PKP and, and DSEC, where it is three times more. And likewise, endothelial cell loss is marginally comparable to the other procedures. So component surgery of cornea is here to stay and refinements and techniques and modifications are required. And having talked about this, full thickness penetrating keratoplasty is still the commonest type of corneal transplantation performed in our, in our country. So these are the books we wrote for corneal transplantation, DAL can be sick. And thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you, ma'am. I think uh, that was a very really informative lecture. And uh, I think with this, we'll go on to the next speaker. I think uh, any questions on behalf of the faculty or panelists, anything we can take from Dr. Namrata right now? If not, then we'll go on to our next speaker, Dr. Vikas Mithun. We'll be uh, talking. I think I can. Uh, Dr. Avinam? Yes. This is one question for Dr. Namrata. Yes, sir. Ma'am, uh, what about your live lenticule versus this uh, biosynthetic lenticule? 
तो बायो सिंथेटिक लेंटिक्यूल आई फील इज बेटर बिकॉज लाइव लेंटिक्यूल और बायो लेंटिक्यूल इफ यू टेक फ्रॉम द डोनर कॉर्निया मेक अ लेंटिक्यूल आउट ऑफ इट एंड पुट इट देयर ओवर अ पीरियड ऑफ टाइम इट इल थिन आउट जस्ट लाइक वी सीन इन डी सेक ग्राफ्ट ओवर अ पीरियड ऑफ टाइम दे थिन आउट सो फॉर डी सेक ग्राफ्ट इट्स ओके दैट दे आर थिनिंग आउट एंड यू नो द विजुअल एक्टिविटी इज गेटिंग बेटर बट इफ यू आर पुटिंग द बायो सिंथेटिक लेंटिक्यूल कॉर्नियाज इट्स नॉट गुड बिकॉज देन with if thinning is going to occur in the very purpose uh, for which it was used you know is kind of defeated so i feel synthetic corneas that way would be better because there would be no thinning over a period of time as opposed to the biolenticules the second your choice uh, dmec versus tdec i used to do i started with dmec and i used to do dmec and then i realized that there were a lot of uh, corneas which were coming Uh, to from our mortuary and from various other places who were younger donors and because hospital cornea retrieval program has become uh, you know so popular that uh, you get younger donors uh, from the hospitals and lot more eyes as opposed to the voluntary donors where it takes longer to get the eye also the death inoculation time also gets prolonged so that is when uh, i decided to shift to pdec and i think the results are, we are doing a randomized study to compare the results Results are quite comparable, and with PDEC you have younger tissue. That is the advantage. Okay. But I think we need to still compare the results. Uh, this is anecdotally that I am uh, telling you that the, it appears to be, you know, comparable. Uh, Dr. Jain is going to speak about uh, component uh, keratoplasty, but I would like to ask about uh, viability of the stem cells from the donor cornea sclerosis, in which we usually receive from the eye bank. can so that be used for a routine purpose if you have a compromised it can be used it can be used if you have to use nimble lenticules for stem cell uh, transplantation they have to be younger so preferably less than 50 years death inoculation time has to be shorter so preferably, preferably within 6 to 8 hours because then on the stem only the stem cells are known to be viable if the death inoculation viable. time is longer yes. yeah or the age is uh, you know more than 50 years then you will not have the stem In fact, our criteria is more stringent. We take death inoculation time less than six hours and age less than forty years. Okay, thank you. I think I'll be introducing the next speaker, Dr. Vikas Mittal. Now, I think he's a true amalgam of private practice and academics. He has an extensive experience in cornea, cataract, and refractive services. He's an awardee of Dr. J. C. Lutra Gold Medal and a T. P. Dr. T. P. Agarwal Trophy. I request Dr. Vikas Mittal to please share his. a talk on corneal perforations and management modalities uh thank you very much abhinav and uh, dhami ai hospital whole group behind the academics i deeply appreciate that you know even in these times the uh, uh, academics has not been stopped so my talk after this very comprehensive and uh, uh, very good uh, presentations by dr namta sharma so i'll be talking on uh, corneal perforations and what are the management modalities so we need to understand that if there's a perforation in cornea means there is a loss of cornea tissue and the replacement can be done only by the cornea tissue that is the ideal but cornea is an allogenic tissue there will be rejection and then if there is a small and we try to suture there will be a lot of suture related issues and small perforations looks like that can be managed with other modalities as well so we are going to see what are the known cornea modalities here so these are the four basic modalities that we generally see and do in our uh, clinics day to day cyanoacrylate glue bcl multilayer amniotic membrane grafting ten patch graft and lamellar corneal patch graft so my my talk in the next 8 uh, 9 minutes i'm going to cover which modality to choose in which patient and what else is there is anything else that needs to be considered that's what we are going to see so which modality to choose one is we'll have to understand and examine the patient thoroughly what is the size of perforation Uh, document what is the location of perforation what is the etiology again very important why it has happened because even if you take care of the etiology the perforation unless you take care of the etiology it is going to come again and what are the logistics around in in your area so this is a very busy slide and we'll come to it uh, later on as far as size of perforation is concerned less than 2 mm perforation can easily be glued by cyanoacrylate glue and it is a time tested very old method and has proven time and again uh, to save a lot of eyes if you have slightly larger perforation like two more than 2 mm and some surrounding tissue loss as well more than uh, beyond it then is better to use either multilayered amniotic membrane grafting or 10 patch graft 
if it is really more and significant uh, surrounding tissue loss then we will have to replace it with some form of cornea cyanoacrylate glue and tenon patch graft these can easily be done by a general ophthalmologist and i think you all should know about it so that you can take care of these eyes so let's see how we use cyanoacrylate glue again it is very easily available very cheap very inexpensive and can be used for you know uh, at least 6 8 6 to 7 eyes easily uh, so i'll just see if we can play this uh, video okay so i'll just show you how we generally do it the cyanoacrylate glue so it is generally available like this all you have to do is just break this ampule and aspirate into this syringe and just we are going to use one drop of cyanoacrylate glue this is a patient who had a corneal perforation as you can see with the slit view you can see the sedal test and sedal test will confirm when we see the egress of aqueous from that small uh, central perforation it is very important to remove epithelium the glue will not stick on the intact epithelium so what i'm doing here is removing around 2 mm surrounding that corneal perforation the epithelium the back of the vexel sponge i'm going to pick and just placing it on the clean side so that a very thin layer of glue comes it's not the heaped up uh, glue comes over that and then we dry it again drying is very important after drying that particular surface you just touch it and within no time it polymerizes as i said removal of epithelium and placing a uh, uh, drying that area is very important sometimes most of the time you can do it in opd but sometimes if the perforation is continuously leaking you will have to take it the patient into or this patient has continuous leak and we will not, we were not able to dry it so we thought that we'll take the patient into or uh, push up some air in the AC aqueous ac and then place a uh, cyanoacrylate glue but this air as you can see was leaky so what i'm trying to do here is taking a very small piece of drape sheet and covering it and then using it as a small patch and then over it i'm placing this glue so after some time when there will be healing epithelium will come under it and we need to you know uh, keep this cyanoacrylate glue for good 3 to 4 months and ensure that we don't push it when the patient is coming into uh, follow up and uh, most of the times when the epithelium grows under it it becomes loose you can see it with the vexel sponge and once it becomes loose you can remove it this is what i was uh, saying about it and then it attracts blood vessels also in itself it has some antibiotic properties also so if there's an infection with small perforation you can easily glue it and take care of the primary etiology whatever the infection is if the perforation is slightly bigger it's more than 2 mm then this patient had a uh, uh, melt status post trigium surgery with mmc done elsewhere as you can see there's a peripheral melt which is slightly bigger although it's in a crescentic form so we did a multi layered amg and as you can see there's a very good results over and it was quietly sealed it is what is important when we do a multi layered amg is it is important to cover it with the conjunctiva so it should we should ensure that the blood comes over there so that otherwise if we place only multi layered amg amg in itself sometimes it may not stick not stick as well this is a patient who had a neurotrophic keratitis and then had a melt and was managed successfully by multi layered amg with fibrin glue the this patient had multi layered amg with sutures again did very well so um, the other uh, the other option if you don't have an access to amniotic membrane graft you can do a tenon patch graft this patient had an autoimmune melt as you can see there is a pretty big melt and uh, it was successfully managed by tenon patch graft i'll show you a short video of tenon patch graft so this patient had undergone uh, uh, cyanoacrylate glue but it was still leaking so we decided because the perforation is slightly bigger we'll do a tenon patch graft so this what you do is you take a tenon from inferior bulbar conjunctiva very important to dissect the section is very important need to ensure that the tenon is freed from the superficial conjunctiva as well as underlying episcleral area and then the perforation surrounding the perforation you create a small pocket with a crescent knife and then you measure what is the uh, and then the same slightly bigger the tenon graft you should take is slightly bigger than the perforation that you have because it is a bulky tissue and ultimately settles down so what i am doing trying to do here is just separate it from the conjunctiva once the superficial conjunctiva is separated 
then you uh, separate it from the underlying sclera and then you place it over the perforation area so this is first it is glued with the uh, sino we have placed a fibrin glue and then in this patient we had placed a amniotic membrane as well although you can do it without amniotic membrane also and very important is these sutures this is a cross sutures it is very important to keep that tenon pa patch graft uh, uh, compressed and this is what uh, typical compression sutures we take and the uh, the host area where from where the tenon patch graft was taken was glued with the fibrin glue so even if you don't have a fibrin glue you can place a small suture here but again this tenon patch graft works beautifully well for uh, most of the patient who have a uh, more uh, than 2 mm surrounding with surrounding corneal uh, tissue loss so this patient was again it was an autoimmune uh, meant you can see it was a pretty big perforation so in this patient what we did was we did a lamellar patch graft lamellar corneal patch graft so what i am trying to do here is just see uh, creating a pocket all over and then seeing what this is what i'm doing is, is measuring what is that what is that uh, size that i need a color uh, corneal patch graft and then just made some mark with uh, dye on the tefton block then uh, this is the lamellar patch this was the patch this was the portion which was left over after dsec anterior stromal tissue and then you just remove all the necrotic tissue surrounding and then suture it with the tenon nylon sutures so this is how it is done and you can see this is a lamellar patch graft so smaller perforation tabcl slightly more you can do a tenon patch graft if it is a slightly is it really a big perforation then you will have to replace it with the corneal tissue and in case you have such a big perforation there is no point in thinking about anything but therapeutic penetrating keratoplasty so uh, this we have already discussed if you have a peripheral melts you can you know easily do a, a tenon patch graft or um, multi layered amg if a center then you can avoid multi layered amg you can prefer rather uh, a tenon patch graft again based on the etiology of perforation if you have infections then ta is better if you have a ocular surface disease like steven johnson syndrome epithelialization is very challenging here again <clears throat> you can use the ta because ta will attract vessels and help in healing if you have a rheumatoid arthritis associated melts tenon patch graft will be great and you can use amniotic membrane or tenon tenon patch graft if you have an osd patients because it helps in the epithelialization as well logistics so you need to see in your clinic in your setup what is available if you you should be able to do all tabcl tenon patch graft at least these two should be able to do and based on you know whatever you have you have to see to it that the eye gets saved uh, very important is you know uh, etiology you must address the cause of collagen lysis is it infective it's a uh, autoimmune if you don't treat the underlying etiology the the whole process the whole uh, process will be wasted and this will come again so uh, to conclude we need to uh, at least uh, learn these two procedures these, these various videos are available uh, on youtube and it's not a very difficult surgery you need to choose based on size of perforation what is the location etiology logistics you need to stay flexible sometimes one one suppose tbcl doesn't work you can think of doing a, a tenon patch graft sometime along with tenon patch graft you can do a tbcl as well thank you so much Thank you, Vikas. A wonderful talk. Abhi, I am exit mode. Thank you, sir. Any question yeah. on the panelists? Anyone process from anyone? We can take Dr. Vikas. Uh, yeah, I have a question for Dr. Vikas. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, in case of in case of a small perforation, less than two mm, and do we need to wait for some time, or as soon as the perforation perforation is diagnosed, we can just So if, if if it is a perforation, it's better to glue, because why? Because otherwise it can suck the infection in, and you can have you know uh, intraocular infection as well. And suppose it stays for long, and the iris uh, lens diaphragm comes forward, it gets stuck over there. You can have a secondary glaucoma as well. Again, you need to understand what is the etiology of perforation. Based on that, you make a call. But whenever we see a perforation, we glue it as early as possible. Okay. okay. Thank you. Hello, Doctor Vikas. Yeah. Hi. Hi, sir. Uh, so I, I wish to know that it, it wouldn't it be better if there is a traumatic perforation, we suture it with tenu and uh, just a single suture, 
it it of course see i am i'm, I'm not, not not talking about traumatic it, we are not talking about corneal tears so okay. corneal tears of course that that is a different uh, uh, yeah. ball game altogether and then we we'll have to repair those, it no corneal tears we do not need to go, uh, give uh, glue is not an option uh, if in case of corneal tears yeah okay so in case of corneal tears say suppose you have a lamellar tear or you have a very small uh, but you you have a ledge there you may consider it but whenever you have full thickness corneal tear the first treatment modality you should offer is corneal suturing now to vikas there is a question yeah. yes sir if the glue doesn't dislodge by itself how do you proceed and how early do you do it so the thing is it has to dislodge there is no reason it will not dislodge so what we generally do is we keep it for 3 to 4 months if it is not we keep on our follow up we just take a vexel sponge and touch it it should move if it is moving means epithelium has come under it and it will it can easily be you know removed suppose it is it is very tight it is very important not to dislodge it manually and you should not do a really a, a, a lot of gymnastics around it what happens is if there is very small perforation that will open up and then again you will have to take the patient to or put up air and place a ta again so if you have but you know and if, uh, you have you can move that uh, glue portion then you know you can you can definitely try to remove it but we wait for at least 3 to 4 months uh, how do you monitor the perforation under the glue so perforation so if the in case you are suspecting that there's still a leak you can do a sidel test and see if there is a leak the leak will be under under from under the uh, the glue that that lo lodged over there and then uh, uh, digitally you can check the prep, uh, pressures and see if there how's ac ac should be well formed tissue should digitally tension should be optimum and the sidel should be negative thank you yeah just one comment just if i can make Sure, sure, yes, sir, please. Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, so sometimes uh, in emergency we have used uh, okay. even a pedicle conjunctival graft for small perforation, especially uh, where there is a iron foreign body with the secondary infection. They come to you many times, and once you remove the foreign body, there is a surrounding infiltration. Here the glue is not going to stick because of the infiltration. so in these cases uh, we have resorted to pedicle graft also and in some cases of uh, traumatic laceration of the cornea where there is a sort of a tri star or a or a star shaped perforation with some some uh, loss of tissue uh, we have done uh, sort of suturing as well as putting a pedicle graft during night when the may not be available to you and one of the important reason of uh, leakage underneath the glue is when the glue is not very smooth even if you have put a bandage contact lens because of the mound which the glue forms uh, you can have with the each bling there is a tug on the on the glue plaque which can gradually dislodge so what we do is instead of putting glue with the back side of the marisol sponge stick what we do is on the marisol sponge stick back side you apply a little amount of glue and a small 3 mm patch of uh, this uh, uh, polythene this and on that you put a tiny dot of uh, uh, glue and then you press upon it then you get a very smooth and very thin a uh, layer of glue and even you can leave that polythene drape a disc there and you may not put a contact lens and it is a very smooth and uh, you may not uh, by i mean sometimes even the bandage contact lens may not be available and it doesn't come off easily because it's very smooth so you have pressed it with the with the polythene drape which is very smooth that is the comment i wanted to make thank you just Dr. one yes one just one thing sir Uh, yeah. is the glue from reliance what is like rally seal equally good or uh, like uh, no rally seal is, that is a fibrin glue yeah That's for smaller glue. smaller perforation it works equally good but if the perforation is larger uh, then we may have to augment it with either a tenon patch or a multi layered uh, amniotic membrane uh, stuffing and a graft yeah so which one you, do you prefer usually like Yeah, it uh, depends upon the affordability. Once you are going to use amniotic membrane and fibrin glue, it's going to cost uh, 
Vibrant Glow itself costs around five thousand to seven thousand, and if you yeah. buy amniotic membrane, that costs another twenty five hundred. So most of these patients are usually socio economically poor, so they are not able to afford those uh, uh, that thing in a in a. Uh, they are not able to afford this thing. So maybe uh, cyanoacrylate glue is a, a better choice in these patients. It's only three hundred yeah. rupees. Yeah. But uh, I, but I don't know whether uh, some of the people had the comment that you can use it for multiple patients. But once you open it and draw into a syringe, I don't think we can keep it. And uh, because you may not get six so, seven patient pulled uh, at one time to use the glue. So cyanoacrylate glue per se it's like betadine, so it cannot yeah. get infected. So that you can what we generally do is we aspirate it and keep it in a refrigerator and we can okay. use it on multiple. All but right. fibrin glue, yes, fibrin glue yeah. is very important. That you'll have to ensure that if you are using sequentially all the aseptic precautions. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Dhami. It was a fantastic uh, talk. I think I. I have one, to... one little question: If yes, you have please. to do, if you have to do a cataract surgery or a VF surgery on a such a patient which has got his perforation sealed. Everything well done. Do, do you expect a complication because of the? So depends. Well, yes. So depends. When are you taking it? So if this nicely scarred, then then I don't think you expect anything because there will be scar, there will be blood vessels. But in case you feel that it's very very thin in particular one particular area and doesn't have blood vessels over there, then it's better to keep the uh, bottle height low. In case you you uh, intraoperatively you get that perforation, you can always place a small air bubble and then you can glue it. But Thank if you. in that particular area you have blood vessels, you don't worry about it at all. There's one Thank more you. question you that do you use uh, anti-segment OCT? No, we we, we uh, sometimes we do it uh, pre or pre uh, when the patient presents, but this more or less has academic importance and just sometimes you need to explain to the patient, and um, uh, very rarely it, it helps in any decision making. You know, in case you want to do a lamellar graft or those kind of things, there it it helps in uh, decision making. Most most of them. Okay. Thank, Thank you. Sir. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much. I think we'll go on to our next now, and it's a privilege for me to invite Dr. Himanshu Matalia, and uh, because he's not just a teacher, a friend, he's the most humble person I've ever met, and a man whose smile can glide you through any tough situation, and he's the uh, medical superintendent and senior consultant for Cornea Refractive and Ocular Services in Maranatha Kalya. He heads the stem cell research laboratory of Maranatha Kalya. His expertise in laser refractive surgeries, cataract surgeries, laser system cornea transplantation, and ocular surface reconstruction. Dr. Vikramachu, I invite you for your talk on ten mistakes you can commit while treating dry eyes, sir. Thank you, Abhinav. Thank you, Dr. Dami. Uh, thank you for hello, as uh, POS, and uh, uh, wonderful to see all of you here on uh, this Sunday. I'm going to talk to you a uh, few things which uh, may be a little different than what we all have learned. I'm not here to point out mistake what we are doing. So that's why I changed the topic to 10 things which we are doing wrong and not just you are doing wrong. Uh, it's not uh, right or wrong in the science. And uh, let me just uh, tell you that uh, this is what we have learned in our entire science. These are my disclosure. I don't have financial disclosure. And I, like anyone, I also have an opinion and I'm entitled to an opinion. That's my disclosure. Let's start with the topic first. The first mistake. That's first mistake itself is the classification of dry eye into aqueous deficient dry eye and evaporative dry eye. Uh, whether it's dues to or whether it's Asia Cornea Society, whatever it may be, we still uh, divide the dry eye into aqueous deficient dry eye, evaporative dry eye. What problem do I have with this thing? Well, whether we call it aqueous deficient dry eye, evaporative dry eye, are we classifying dry eye based on the root cause or it's the effect of some problem? Well, actually, it's effect of some problem, right? When the aqueous is less, I mean, when the tear part secretion is less, we call it aqueous deficient dry eye, but that was not the root cause. So the classification does not actually give you the root cause. Uh, so why does it matter? Well, interestingly, we know that not all the dry eyes are same. 
can dry eye with rheumatoid arthritis be same as dry eye with mgd just because their uh, shermer's value was same well certainly not we know that's not going to be right shouldn't we treat the root cause of the problem and not the effect of the problem of course that's intuitive but unfortunately that's not what we are doing we wait for the sign of dry eye which means the damage so we wait for the damage to occur and then try to treat it's something like let me give an example now this is example of uh, hemopoietic stem cell transplant anybody who has undergone hemopoietic stem cell transplant they would have a tendency to get graft versus host disease in fact if they live long enough at one point of time they would have graft versus host disease and all these cases they ultimately do end up getting severe dry eye so in spite of us knowing that they are going to get graft versus host disease because of our definition we'll say no you know what you do not have dry at this point of time we will wait now this is something similar to what uh, an advertisement which we used to see in our childhood ab lag gaya oi oi lalke piche dekh lag raha hai kya abhi lag rahi hai kya lag raha hai kya abhi lag rahi hai kya dekh abhi This is what we do for these patients. We keep seeing them every time, and we say, "No damage, no damage, no damage. You don't have dry eye." Till they come with the damage, and then we say, "You know what? We will treat it, but dry eye is irreversible. Whatever damage has occurred, we are not going to repair it back." And that's ridiculous, right? We waited for damage to occur, and now we are telling them that that is irreversible. Okay, so. i would prefer that whenever you're dealing with inflammatory dry and where you know certainly you are going to get damage treat them in advance you don't wait for the damage to occur second mistake the most important test for dry eye diagnosis shermer's word that's what uh, your friends if you're not going to a specialist they would do shermer's and they send it across to you no dry eye uh let's see the test which uh, most of us are advised to do like say do you used to they tell you diagnostic test symptom uh, symptomat uh, symptomatology or the questionnaires tfm break up time osmolarity ocular surface staining whatever we know that these are the gold standard like uh, the questionnaire quality of vision ocular surface staining uh, staining tfm break up time shermer's test again same question do these thing diagnose the root cause of the dry eye or just the effect well we know it's just the effect but how can you have tbut and think about what can be the root cause well interestingly we don't learn that but there are some ways to do that but most of the time whatever we do it's based on what uh, we 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 take aqueous deficient or tfm or you know, the evaporative now very interesting part uh, asia corner society came up with the interpretation of uh, tfm break up time on fluorescent staining this is very good now does it mean this is uh, short short and uh, full proof no uh, not always is this kind of thing works but what they found out from their quite decent study on your tfm break up time you may have some idea about some pathology that is it related to the uh aqueous deficiency is it evaporative it will certainly give you some idea about uh, uh, that mistake number 3 the frequency of lubricant drop four times a day somehow i really don't know why this has come but all of us all of the neurologists we love to write lubricants four times a day now let's see why these things are important how does a, a drug stay on the surface and the thing is called ocular surface resident time that's the time for which a drug will stay on the surface of uh, the eye this depends on the viscosity or the rheological property of uh, the lubricant blink rate it depends on the temperature depends on the ph of the surface ph of the lubricant tear uh, clearance rate adsorption of lubricant on the surface and evaporation rate we know that every patient cannot have every factor same so each one of us can have different ocular surface resident time very interestingly anthony brown from uh, from uk his group had uh, studied the tfm uh, or ocular surface resident time of 
artificial tears or lubricants on the surface. Uh, you cannot study a time for which a molecule stays on the surface because that fag and Then communication failed. Some disruption somewhere, I think. I think there's a small glitch in the network, I guess. Yeah, no problem. Him? The first few switches are... Uh, no. Achha, achha. Okay, okay. 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 I think we can have the next talk because Dr. Hamanchu is uh, having some internet problem. Uh, Neelima, will you please introduce Dr. Akijan? Is Neelima online? Neelima? Can start yeah, yeah. you are audible. You are audible, Doctor. Oh, uh, Nilima. Okay. So then I'll introduce. Uh, let me introduce yourself, sir. Okay, no problem. <laughs> well, it's pleasure to have you. Though Nilima was there to introduce you, I don't know. Sadly, she has gone off the. No, no, it's right. okay. Uh, Doctor Arun is a friend, a professional friend, who looks after us a lot. His smile is always generous. As generous as he is, of course, the problems we have, we have a lot of problems, and PGI is there to solve for us. Dr. Arun, we always look forward for you, and we are proud that you are going up, up in ranks in the PGI okay. levels. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, Please. Thank, thank you so much, Dr. Dhami, for the kind words, and uh, at the very outset, can you see my screen? Oh, yes. Please yes. share it. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so at the very outset, I'd uh, like to thank uh, Ludhiana Ophthalmological Society as well as uh, Punjab Ophthalmological Society as well as uh, Dhami Group of Hospital Eye Care Hospital for giving me this opportunity to share my views on the simultaneous split corneal transplantation for two recipients. Uh, Dr. Namata gave a wonderful talk about the component of corneal surgery and uh, it is just a continuation of that how we can in today's era when the, there are so many restrictions and eye banking also 
and the corneas are hard to come by so here and with the advancement uh, in the eye bank ah uh, yeah we we will restart your talk again huh? uh no. so i have sure. no financial sure. interest in sure. the sure. subject matter of the stock and as i was saying uh, the number of corneal blindness this is uh, 2006 7 uh, figures and uh, at that time it was shown that uh, we need around 140000 cornea annually which are just uh, i mean at present we are collecting around 40 to 50000 corneas annually but in a recent survey which was completed last year in 2019 by rp center it has shown that uh, corneal blindness has uh, increased from 0.4 to 0.9% so we are needing more and more cornea and in the present era of covid where the cornea is hard to come by using one cornea for multiple patient is the way to go and dr namata has already uh, highlighted various types of uh, component corneal surgery be it a uh, deep laminal endothelial keratoplasty or dissec or demac or anterior laminal keratoplasty or deep anterior laminal keratoplasty and uh, uh, way back in uh, 2007 uh, uh, this group from uh, rp center vajpai namrata et al they published uh, one cornea being used for three patient they used uh, their limbal stem cell as well as uh, the anterior and posterior part of cornea for endothelial keratoplasty and anterior laminal keratoplasty for corneal opacity and uh, recently there are lot of publication which shows that uh, split corneal transplantation uh, from a single cornea can be used uh, for two recipient and it reduce the demand by almost 40% and these are the various uh, publication in recent times which uh, shows that how these cornea can be used for multiple recipient and the largest series is by hinder at all where they use split corneal transplantation and uh, use it in various ways and how it can be used the entire part of the cornea is used for like you can do a dark and a demac uh you can separate the demac scroll and the rest of the cornea can be used for dark so what i am going to show today is uh, and as i was saying with the advancement of uh, uh eye banking system now these uh, tissue can be even the component tissue can be stored in the eye bank for quite a long time so the logistics of the patient can be also overcome easily so you can uh, plan the surgery in effective ways you can call the patient make a list so you don't have to do the surgery in an emergency situation so you can plan your surgery accordingly so here i am preparing a one this uh, corneal tissue this is the hana strefine you can uh, uh, pre uh, so guarded uh, depth of the corneal uh, tissue can be achieved with this hana strefine and then you separate the anterior and posterior lamella so or if you don't have hana strefine one can use the guarded blade also one can mark it with a strefine and enter at maybe 400 micron or if you are do, planning to do a dark or demac one can do a create a bubble and uh, or not a bubble uh, though people have described bubble for separate separating uh, demac uh, uh, desmet tissue but the routine method is to uh, use uh, that scuba technique so here we have used that anterior lamellar graft uh, i'll come to this later on so once you have split the graft into two uh, the anterior portion the posterior portion is, i here i have uh, used for doing a, a desmet desmet uh, stripping endothelial keratoplasty here you mark the area of the endothelium to be scraped uh, here this patient had a bullous keratopathy this is a fake patient so uh, you make a 4 to 5 mm uh, corneal tunnel and uh, then we uh, sort of uh, it, this is optional listing whether you want to stain the desmets or not because then desmets become easy to see sometimes if the cornea is hazy it is difficult to see 
uh, decimate. So you stain the decimate and then with the reverse Sinsky hook, you uh, make a, a decimate, uh, decimate of Rexy along the marked area, which is around eight millimeters, 7.5 to eight. You don't want to make a large Desmetorexes because then uh, uh, it will go into that angle area. So then you, you do a desmet stripping. So you can see the desmets is stained. It is quite thick in this case, the desmets. Uh, you have to scrape it fully. Uh, and once you remove this desmet, you can see that it has come in one piece. It's quite a thick desmet. And then you the various techniques of putting the uh, posterior lamellar, this thing, uh, Dr. Namrata has already shown. Uh, I usually use a taco fold, two third into one third. This is a taco fold. And uh, then you unfold the graft. And Ideally, one should put a suture here. Otherwise, there are chances that this uh, graft can come out. Ideally, no, one should put, no. put sutures. Uh, and then once the graft is unfolded, uh, you inject an air bubble behind the graft. And uh, so, and wait for five to seven minutes and in recent times uh, again Tital have shown that you may not wait for eight minutes uh, even three to five minutes uh, are good enough if you have uh, intraoperative OCT available with you. So that is the end of one surgery. So with the other part of the uh, so this is on first post of day and over a period of time uh, over a period of two three weeks time the graph becomes clear and the second part we the anterior lamellar portion we use for granular uh, dystrophy. This is a 60 year old person who is a professor in Niper. Other eye has already undergone penetrating keratoplasty. So here again, I have uh, uh, marked the cornea up to the up to the 400 uh, microns, and I'm doing the lamellar dissection because most of the uh, opacities were in the anterior part of the cornea. So once you do the dissection, because uh, I did uh, lamellar, you may be, you can do a, a dark also in this case, uh, or other eye has undergone penetrating keratoplasty, and it has very high astigmatism. And uh, he has to use a hard contact lens to neutralize uh, that astigmatism. So this is the anterior portion of the same graph. So after putting the graft, you have to suture it. I mark it with the eight prong radial marker so that you pass the suture in a uh, uh, equidistant manner. Uh, after putting four sutures, I put a continuous suture. This is the end at the end of the surgery. And uh, uh, this is the right eye I was telling. This has undergone, you can see there's a little bit of graft ectasia and there's a recurrence of granular dystrophy and this is the reflective error in this eye. Without contact lens, uh, he's not able to see clearly and this is the reflection. And in this eye, uh, there's a hardly, he's uh, having a very good uh, vision with this much of uh, uh, reflection and without glasses, he's able to read also. So just, so we, uh, here I have shown just one cornea being used for two patients and a split use of donor corneal tissue for combined anterior lamellar and DASIC procedure or uh, DMEC and uh, DARC can be uh, used in present day times and it is, uh, has a quite a promising future and uh, it reduces the demand of the uh, cornea by almost 40%. Uh, thank you so much for uh, patient hearing. If you have any questions, I'll... Uh, uh, happy to answer the questions. Thank you, Dr. Jain. That was an excellent mind-blowing presentation. Very good surgery. And uh, thank you, sir. putting forward such a useful thing of the cornea, 
and such a clarity to the patient is a pleasure seeing and knowing though we are not we doing much but definitely we know that it can be done thank you very yeah. much yeah thank you sir thank you sir thank you for your uh, dr neelma you are online dr neelma okay our next speaker is dr samira she is well known though she is from the cross borders but she is none other than part of a fan of the punjab of thalmic society and the surgeons in punjab i have to read something about her i will well most of us should know she is one person as a student never stood second one gold medals in mbbs in frcs everywhere and after practicing more than 20 years abroad he came back to pakistan that's a big thing that should be in the mind of everyone proud of you dr samira our countries need our students need teachers like you thank you so much dr she has represented pakistan as an invited international faculty and a good guest speaker in more than and a fond of thermologist in this part of the country i remember dr daljeet singh always mentioning her name this will be taught and done by dr samira we are proud of you samira it's a pleasure to have you and a moment of pride to be with you to hear about a most important topic we miss we fault and we commit mistakes thank you she is going to speak on principles of prescribing spectacles correction in different groups of ages it's not children it's different group of ages please thank you you're welcome dr meera thank you so much damiji for inviting me and this elaborate this uh, introduction i'm so grateful please to share be your here. screen part of pos okay is this uh, is this visible dami ji yeah 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 sabira yeah okay so uh, i chose this topic uh, because uh, every person they uh, once in a while in the in one's life they would need glasses and uh, we as ophthalmologists always assume that prescribing glasses is the job of an optician or an optometrist But the thing is, we live in a third world country, and how many trained ophthalmolog uh, op optometrists or opticians do we have? So it's the job of every ophthalmologist to know about what to prescribe in a patient. We do these autoref and we do the retinoscopies, but that's just a reading. It's just a number, and uh, unless we know the certain principles. uh we cannot just prescribe what that reading says because the wrong prescription of glasses it results in headache diplopia dizziness and all kinds of problem including strabismus and uh, but if we give correct glasses then they straighten up the eyes and in any non paralytic strabismus if it's less than 15 degrees so that has to be kept in mind so i will talk to you uh, explain to you certain concepts which you should as a general ophthalmologist be very clear about uh, before you embark on writing the number uh, on a, uh, a prescription card for the glasses so convergence it is a necessity for binocular single vision throughout our life when a baby is born 
the eyeballs they are out uh, uh, deviated outwards they are aligned because the orbits are shaped like that and when the baby opens its eyes the first thing that a baby does is to converge and why is convergence needed to have a single view in space with both eyes directed at the same object in space and that is called the Panem's fusion area. So if both eyes are directed at the Panem's fusion area at a single object in space, only then that image will be fused in the brain. And as the child grows, both eyes will see and the vision will develop and uh, clarity of image is needed. So convergence is the primary necessity for binocular single vision and then go two good seeing eyes with equal vision. So uh, that's the first concept that has to be kept in mind, the fact that has to be kept in mind while prescribing glasses that by our surgery or by our prescription of glasses, we don't ruin this convergence, we preserve it. Then another important concept is the ocular motility balance. Our eyes are straight, why? Because of a balance between convergence and accommodation on one hand and divergence on the other hand. With age, accommodation and convergence it reduces and around the age of eight, nine, 10, divergence begins to increase. And why is that? When a baby is born and as it's growing up, his, uh, the child's horizon is very narrow. He wants to learn things, he, he uh, is into reading, writing. So the accommodation and convergence is uh, to its extreme. But then when he becomes a teenager, he has more life outdoors, the divergence comes into play and it gradually increases with age while at the same time, conversions goes on reducing. So what this means? This means that this graph is from the American Academy of Pediatric Ophthalmology and Strabismus and look at the prevalence of refractive errors that uh, uh, around the age of two, three, there are only uh, the very, uh, the mild hypermetropia is around 80 to 90% in children, mild hypermetropia. And that mild hypermetropia it goes on reducing gradually with the passage of time. After the age of five, six, the hypermetropia keeps on reducing. Similarly, high hypermetropia, which is depicted by the red line, it is only seen in about 10 to 15% of the children. It also increases gradually till the age of four, five, six. And after the age of six, there is a sharp decline till it uh, comes, touches the baseline around nine, 10, 11 years. So what does this graph tell you? That every person, every child in, him, in whom you prescribe plus correction, hypermetropic correction, you have to reduce it after the age of six, seven or eight. Because if you don't, then there is technically, logically, there is no need for that high correction. And if you don't, convergence is already on the decline, divergence is getting active, and so consecutive exotropia will occur. So that is the reason many children come to me wearing thick plus glasses and the eyeballs directed outwards. And as I will show you the examples in the next few slides. So this graph, extremely important to be kept in mind when you are prescribing glasses and when you are following up these children. Another fact is the emetropization. Axial length of a neonate's eye is only 17 millimeter. It's a small eye. So small eyeball, small image size and a hazy detail. And then in the first year of life, the most of emetropization occurs. 80% of emetropization occurs in the first year of life and then it continues to the age of three. So by the age of three, uh, the eyeball and the brain have attained 85% of the adult size. So brain and eyeball, because it's a part of the brain, 
they attain 85% of the adult size, though the height is still very small. So that tells you that anything, if it goes wrong in these first three years of life, it will drastically affect the development of the eyeball as well as all the visual connections. So 95% of babies, they are born hypermetropic because of this small size eyeball. And by the age of one year, only 45% stay hypermetropes. The remaining, they become emetropes by the process of emetropization. So how does this emetropization occur? This is because the blurred signal, it goes to the brain and makes the eyeball grow. The axial length increases because of this blur signal. So unnecessarily, we do not need to abolish this blur signal. Somebody can say, okay, let's start treating all this hypermetropia by the age of one year. Why is there any need? This hypermetropia is going to reduce on its own because of this emetropization process. The blur signal will make the eyeball grow and you don't need to give glasses to these babies or even toddlers. You don't need to. Unless and unless there is a problem. The child is brought to you with a problem. And what those problems could be? Strabismus, diplopia, asthenopia, headache, or the child is closing one eye outdoors, or they're rubbing the eyes, or watching TV, standing very close to it. Then yes, if the child or the baby is brought to you with these problems, then yes, you have to correct that refractive error. But the mild refractive errors up to two, four uh, of hypermetropia, you don't need to correct them in asymptomatic children. So how you decide whether you need to correct it or not, you do the cover test. Every ophthalmologist, they should be proficient in doing cover test. It is a very simple test. And if you see that the eyes are steady, they have a central sustained fixation, central fixation, then, and the baby is asymptomatic, you don't need to give any refractive correction. But any symptoms, you have to correct. So the child comes to you, the parents have brought the child to you, and you ask the symptoms, and then you check the vision according to the age, and then you perform the cover test. So what is the significance of uh, the cover test? If the eyeball is uh, moving from out uh, of the, uh, when, the, when you put the cover and then when you remove the cover, it turns inwards, it means it was exophoric. So if the child is having an exophoria, you have to make a note in the notes before you write the number which has been given to you by your assistant or your optician, that this is the uh, reading from the, the autoref or the retinoscopy. First, you have to have that reading, vision first, then the cover test. And according to the cover test, you have to decide, you're going to give a plus number, you're going to give a minus number. And not just that reading that has been handed over to you by your assistant. And then once you've done the cover test, you've noted the finding of the cover test, then you decide whether you're going to do a refraction with cyclopen, with atropine, home atropine, or a dry refraction. So how are you going to decide that? If the child has an exophoria, of course, you are going to reduce, give him the minimum plus correction or the minus correction. And in that, the cyclopen pentolate eye drops given in the clinic three times uh, after an interval of 10, 10 minutes. And then after half an hour to 40 minutes, you do the diffraction. Cyclopentolate has an onset of action in 30 minutes and you can effectively do the refraction at 45 minutes. On the other hand, if the cover test shows you an esophoria or the child is brought to you with an esotropia, then you have to do a refraction with home atropine or atropine. The difference between uh, home atropine and atropine is 
the atropine takes about three days to act. It's a longer acting, it's a slow acting drug and uh, full effect, full cycloplegia occurs, takes about almost one day and the effect lasts for 10 days. On the other end, home atropine, it produces full cycloplegia in about one hour. So safely after one hour in the clinic, you can do the red fraction. So why do we need to give cyclopen for an exotropia and home atropine or atropine for an esotropia? This is very important to remember because if, when the eye is going in, it means that the child is using a lot of accommodation. And every, uh, to reduce that accommodation, to totally remove that accommodative influence, you have to correct the whole of, uh, or remove the whole influence. Normally, ciliary muscles, they have tone, and that tone causes an hypermetropia of 1.5 to 2 diopters. So if, you, uh, if a child who has an esotropia and you are doing a uh, refraction after instilling cyclopen, you are undercorrecting that child with, uh, by 1.5 to 2 diopters. So I'll show you the examples in a minute. And if the child is about six years or more, then you have to call them for a subjective refraction because you have to give the maximum plus that gives maximum uh, vision, maximum visual acuity. And if it's a myo, you have to give them a minimum minus that gives a maximum vision. That's how it goes. So you have to remember certain facts regarding lenses. The plus lenses, they relax accommodation and conversions. The image is brought closer to the nodal point. Remember, it's a short eyeball. And with that short eyeball, the image is formed behind the retina. So when you put a plus lens in front of that eye, the image is brought closer to the nodal point of the normal lens. So that image which is brought closer to the nodal point is magnified and it is real. And because of that magnified image, the need for accommodation, the need for convergence is reduced. And that is why we give plus lenses in an ET. And to reduce that or abolish this convergence and accommodation, you have to have total cycloplegia with atropine or home atropine. On the other hand, in a myope, you need minus glasses. Now, minus lenses, the uh, myopic eye is a large eye, larger eyeball, and light rays are focused by the normal lens of that eye in front of the retina. But when you give the minus glass, which it, it results in the image moving backwards and focusing on the retina. So the image is moving away from the nodal point of the normal lens of the eye, natural lens of the eye. So that image is inverted and it is small. It's the cure. Yeah, no. And minus lenses, they induce accommodation and, they, and because the accommodation and convergence is linked together, so they make the eye converge as well. So plus lenses and minus lenses, they are totally opposite to each other. And when you have done your cover test, and now you know whether you are going to give a minus lens or a plus lens. So if it's an esotropia, you are going to give atropine or home atropine and giving, going to give the full plus correction, full means with atropine or home atropine, whatever reading you get, you have to give all of it. But if it's an exotropia, then with the cyclopen uh, refraction, you have to give the minus lens, minimum minus, which is going to give you maximum vision. And then if a child comes to you already wearing glasses, what are you going to do? It's your job as an ophthalmologist to see whether the gla these glasses are correct. Look at the glasses in these children. 
the one this uh, child is looking from above the glasses. Are they doing any good to this child? No. Then the child below is almost the same. They are not focused, centered on the pupil. The child, the children, they are looking from above the uh, glass. So when the child comes to you, you have to see whether the glasses are properly centered. The center of the lens is where the center of the pupil is. And uh, I'll tell you uh, uh, in a minute, why is that important? And then you have to see that with the glasses on, the patient has the eyes straight or with the glasses on, he has an exotropia or they are going in. So with the glasses on, again, you have to perform the cover test at each visit. And if the patient is orthophoric with the glasses on, and the vision is 6-6 six, six in both eyes. At that visit, you don't have to worry. Let him go. Come back again in four months or six months. And then do the same vision first with the glasses on. And then the cover test with the glasses. And if you have given him plus glasses and at that visit, you see an exophoria. The eye ball moving out of it at that visit, you have to reduce the plus correction. Because if you don't, as I showed you the graph, hypermetropia is reducing with age, convergence amplitude is reducing with age, and plus glasses are removing all that convergence and the accommodation. And if at that visit, you haven't done the cover test with the glasses on, and uh, you have reduced the number of the plus correction, in about six months or four months, when the child will come again to you, he will have a frank exotropia. What will you do then? Do surgery? Your surgery will fail. I'll show you why in a minute. So uh, why is centration of glasses important? Centration is important because there is the prismatic effect of lenses. The plus lenses, they are biconvex and they act as two prisms based in. On the other hand, the concave lenses, the minus lenses, they act as two prisms based out. So if the glasses are like this, as in this child, where the optical center, the center of the glass is fairly below the center of the pupil, then it induces a prismatic effect. And the child has double vision. It has uh, asthenopia, headache, blurred vision. And you will wonder oh, what's wrong. The problem is right in front of you that the center of the pupil is not where the center of the glass is. The glasses are directed downwards. And the optical center of both the eyeball and the center of the lens should be aligned, should be marked by the person who is making these glasses. So this is a bad frame. And uh, how much uh, prismatic effect you get is by this uh, uh, equation that the prismatic effect of lens is in prism diopters is H into D. H is the distance where the pupil, a uh, distance between the pupil and the center of the lens that is H. So say the center of the lens is about two millimeter below the center of the pupil. So two times, and if he's wearing plus two, so two times two is four. So the prismatic power of this glass, which is the prismatic effect it's inducing is four diopter base in prism. So this child is bound to have problems while reading and while looking at a distance. So this has to be kept in mind when you are prescribing glasses, is your patient and you're responsible for proper centration, proper prescription. So this is a proper prescription. He has proper glasses, eyes uh, straight, and a little bit of esophoria at this visit. If he's 6'6", six, six, he's tw uh, about 12 years of age, and he's 6'6 six, six with these glasses, but the eye is a little bit in then I will slightly increase the prescription, the plus number. But if he is, uh, uh, let's see the next one. Why is it important? I think it, uh, this child, he had prescription from someone else and uh, he was, it was the prescription was given by cyclopentylate refraction. 
So the cycloventrolate already you are cutting down by 1.5 to 2 diopters because you are not correcting the tonal hypermetropia. Hypermetropia due to tone of the ciliary muscle. So you have given less correction. When you are doing the refraction, you are covering one eye and uh, you face, feel, okay, uh, you read the Snellens and the child says it's 6'6 six, six, and you give the glasses. But when the child wears the glasses, come back to you and now there is slight under correction, the eyeball is still in. So what does that in eyeball mean? It means that with the glasses on, the fovea, the, the optical center of both eyeballs are not aligned. Both eyeballs are not focused. And so light is not falling on the fovea of either eye. One eye is slightly in and that eye will have an extra foveal fixation and the vision will never be 6-6. Six, six. Vision with correction would only be 6-6 six, six if both foveas are stimulated simultaneously. And that will only happen if the esotropia is fully corrected. So if you are only correcting two thirds of the hypermetropia, which usually ophthalmologists as well as uh, opticians do, then there is always, always extra foveal fixation. The hypermetropia is not fully corrected. The eye stays in and the vision is not 6-6 six, six with both eyes. So only full cycloplegia, it ensures foveal fixation and absolute straightening of the eyes. Right, so for every patient who is your patient nowadays, everybody is into reading, into gadgets. If the child continues to do this much of close work with bad posture, bending down, stooping, while writing and reading, then it results in too much convergence, too much accommodation, even though it's wearing full correction. This too much accommodation and too much convergence will result in again blurred of vision and it can result in accommodative spasm. Many of these patients come to you with an ET, sudden onset ET, and that is because of accommodative spasm. So when the patient comes to you for glasses, you have to tell the parents that they have to have adjust their postures. They should adopt a proper posture while reading and writing, sit up straight, hold the book in front of the eye at an eye level. Similarly, the gadgets, the screens, you have to uh, cut down the screen time to minimum. These days, uh, all because of the locked in situation, everybody has given homework on screens. Well, you have to tell the parents to get the printouts of the homework and they should help the parent, the children do their homework through the printouts on the paper. They should not, you should, you should not let them get addicted to these screens because they are doing a lot of harm. So uh, an example, whether it's an eight month old or a four year old with an isotropia, what you have to do is uh, the usual questions that the parents ask is, why is this isotropia? Almost always it's refractive, almost always until proven otherwise. And will the vision be okay? Yes, if they wear glasses, it will be perfect. And glasses have to be proper glasses, which I've told you properly centered and they have to cut down. Then the next question is, for how long? Are they going to wear glasses forever? Then you have to tell them that, look at this graph. This graph has to be kept in mind that hypermotropia is going to reduce gradually. But only, only, only mm -hmm. if you're going to cut down the near work, if you're going to cut down the accommodative stimulus. And then after the, uh, the hypermetropia gradually increases, very gradually, 0.5 diopter every six months till the age of three, four, five years, then it stabilizes and then it starts reducing, provided you cut down the bending, stooping and gadgets. That's how it is. And there, will they, uh, the other question is, will they need surgery? No, no need, absolutely not. 
So let's see a few examples. Bad management by other people that this uh, age 12 and the eye is out and she's still wearing plus 4.5. So what are you going to do? Remove the 4.5 and uh, do her surgery? No, you can't do surgery. Surgery is going to fail. She needs 4.5 to see because the, the removal of plus number is gradual. You cannot just remove the plus glasses and do surgery because the vision will be blurred. The 12 year old has to do a lot of uh, near work and plus glasses, they magnify the image. So they are addicted. Their whole optical system is addicted to this plus 4.5. So what you will do is you will gradually, gradually, every three months, reduce 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.5 uh, till she's off these glasses. And uh, in the meantime, you will ask her to take the glasses off and do convergence exercises with the glasses off. So that whatever convergence uh, has been tempered with because of this plus correction comes back and her XT will get better. If in this situation you go and do an XT surgery, your surgery will fail. Why? Because convergence, her convergence is zero. And even if you relax the uh, lateral recti, the eye will not come in because there, there is no convergence. So what are you going to do? Uh, plus glasses are moving the eye out. You have released the lateral recti but the medial recti, they are not working. So surgery, how can surgery work? So the best option in this is to remove the plus gradually and ask, give her convergence exercises and she will be fine. Another example, this uh, girl had an ET surgery at the age of three. Now she's 14 and still wearing the plus correction. So the surgeon, they forgot to remove the plus correction, which they should have. So once in an ET, you do a bimedial recession, you are minimizing the convergence. And then on top of it, the girl is wearing uh, such a huge number. So the eye is bound to develop a consecutive exotropia. So the plan, again, to re gradually reduce the plus correction. Once the plus sphere is removed, plus sphere should come down to zero but you can't remove the cylinder. So what about the plus cylinder? You have to change it to the minus cylinder in the opposite meridian. Why? I'll tell you in a minute. And give her convergence exercises. Maybe surgery would be avoided. But as long as she wears plus, you cannot do anything for her. So next is exotropia. I think uh, there's a two, three, four uh, talks uh, on all the management of strabismus. So I'll just go through it quickly. What is exotropia occur natural history? I just showed you this uh, graph. Convergence is reducing. This is normal physiology. And divergence is increasing in teenagers around the age of eight to, eight to nine. At the same time, the myopia sets in. At the same time, they are doing too much close work and therefore the myopia gradually increases. And that's the age when an exophoria starts and if nothing is done, then it becomes an intermittent XT and if nothing is done there, then the intermittent XT becomes a constant or an alternating XT. So that's how it progresses around from starting from age five, six, when the convergence amplitude is reducing, the XT starts appearing. So if the patient comes to you who has an XT and wearing, uh, given by someone else, your colleague, this correction, because that's what it was uh, when he ch did the auto ref, then in the clinic, I, I'm giving you the example, his eyeball are like this, but in the clinic, I've removed the plus spherical, only given the cylinder in the same meridian, and look, the eyeball has come in a bit. It has, and now he will do the convergence exercises and it will be okay. Similarly, her, 12 years old, vision 69, for near, she has an exophoria, but for distance, it is a large XT. So let's see her refraction. Her refraction was plus 2.5 cell at 90. So if I give her plus 2.5, her XT, XT is still, it's out, the eyeballs are out. But in the clinic, I gave her the minus cylinder in the opposite meridian. She was plus 2.5 at 90. So in the clinic, I gave her minus 2.5 at 180. 
her eyeballs have come in and she is 6'6 six, six. and that's what she will get. Now, how does this work? So let's see. A person has an astigmatism or mixed and she is both myopic uh, meridian and there is an exotropic, uh, is uh, myopic as well as hypermetropic meridian. So what I'm doing is in an exotropia, I am only correcting the myopic meridian and I'm allowing the eyeball to accommodate for the hypermetropic meridian. And that accommodation and convergence will bring the eyeball in. As so her vision will be 6-6 six, six because I've just given the cylinder to correct the myopic meridian while the hypermetropia is going to be corrected by herself using her accommodation and the convergence. So this is not just one patient. I have so I mean, a whole hundred and uh, it works and you should try it too. And um, it's nothing rocket science, very easy to do. Do not correct plus meridian in children, 12, 13, 14, no, even in elderly. You have to give the minus cylinder in whatever meridian is there and let the accommodation and convergence uh, take care of the plus. Now, if I've very, just five minutes or three minutes on this early presbyopia. People, they come to me in the age of 20, 30, 40, 50 even with a full bag of glasses and they're not happy with any glass. As soon as they put the glasses on, it, they can read for a while and then they have to take them off. Why? Because the problem is, as you can see in both these patients, whether the lady is she's in her 30s and the gentleman is in 40s and they both have uh, three or four pairs of plus reading glasses but nothing is helping them and they're fed up and miserable. And that's because as soon as they put the plus glasses on, the uh, whatever convergence and accommodation they have is relaxed and the eyeball goes out. And when the eyeball goes out more, they get double vision, they get headache and uh, they are so unhappy. So th uh, this is because after, as I sh you have to remember that graph, that convergence is going rapidly down after the age of 10. So you have to have to do the cover test before you prescribe any correction to any patient. So these patients, they come with eye strain and blurring of vision for near. They go to an optician or even an ophthalmologist and they give the plus number and the plus is going to do an XT, make it an XT. So uh, it, it further decreases the accommodation, further reduces the convergence. And this is what they are doing, taking the glassing off, glasses off, trying to read, trying to close one eye to read. They're trying to close the more exotropic eye so that they focus with one eye. And uh, this is an extremely common problem. So what you have to do, you have to do the cover test. The eyeball is going in you do their refraction and whatever minus uh, is there, you give that. If it's a cylinder plus cylinder, you change it to the opposite meridian and give the minus cylinder and give them convergence exercises. This is what they need. Everyone, all of us, we need convergence exercises starting from the age of 15. So once you start doing convergence exercises, Press biopia is delayed. I'm 57. I still don't wear any press biopic glasses. No way. I do all my work. Because a, a whole day I'm teaching patients how to do convergence exercises. People say convergence, this pencil push-ups don't work. It's because you don't teach them properly how to do it. So the way to do it, even with a finger or a pencil, you bring the pencil close to the nose to the tip of the nose and count five. So eyeball, they are going in. You feel it, they are going in and do it 20 times in the morning, 20 times in the evening. And you will, your own press biopia will be delayed by mid fifties. In my clinic, 
I don't prescribe reading glasses till the age of mid fifties, early fifties, mid fifties, and who have come walks into my clinic younger, we tend to reduce their plus if they are our eyeballs usually are out. So you give them convergence exercises, you teach them to keep the phone or whatever uh, at a slightly more distance. And you, what I do is I take their photograph and I tell them, look, this is the problem. Eyes out and you are wearing plus, it is getting more and more and more out. And unless you are going to help yourself, nobody can help you. And helping themselves is by glasses, uh, minimum or none. Our minus is there, yes, you give them minus. Number one, two convergence exercises. They, they can reduce the, uh, they can increase the font size. They should reduce the brightness of the computer or the cell phone and stop watching movies on the cell phone. They can do it on the computer or whatever. And uh, always all the gadgets, they should be at eye level. They should not be this. When you are, we are bending our heads, our whole, the uh, weight of our head is around 24, 25 kg, kilograms. So when we are bending, stooping, the whole 25 kg weight is falling on the cervical, uh, this uh, cervical junction and uh, 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 all these vertebrae. Uh, the cervical vertebrae are, are very uh, small and and all the pressure, it falls on the neck muscles and you have continuous backache and neck problems because of continually bending down, stooping down and doing close work for long hours. So that's what you have to teach them. So in the end, I would like to say thank you. Cover test should be your guide. You all have to learn to give uh, uh, prescribed glasses yourself. It's not the job of the optician or the optometrist. It's your job. They are your patients and you're responsible for them. So after vision, cover test should guide you what to give, how much to give. And if there are, uh, the patient is symptomatic, if the child is symptomatic but orthophoric, then you give minimum correction that gives maximum vision. If the child has an esophoria or, is, or an esotropia, you have to give the full correction with atropine or home atropine. And uh, then the child should wear appropriate glasses with appropriate means, proper centration, and reassess after six weeks. And then once the child is five, six years old, you have to gradually reduce the plus correction. After doing, of course, the cover test at each visit till they are off their plus glasses. And regarding the, you have to teach every patient minimum near visual activities and minimum screen time. You know, in Scandinavian countries, they have banned screens, no computers, no laptops in schools. They are reading, only doing studying from the books. And we are, we feel proud our child is computer smart, screen smart. We all, always go the wrong way. So it's high time we learn that uh, screens are extremely damaging to our children. They have uh, immature retinas, immature brains, and these immature retinas and brains, they are very much susceptible to the electromagnetic rays There's, that are emitted from these digital screens, and they cause mitosis of the cells and damage the neuronal circuits. These days, there are many reports of head and neck cancers in children because of overexposure to these gadgets. So these are our children. We have to educate parents that they are harmful <clears throat> and you have to stop using them. So teach them proper posture while reading and that is our job too, nobody else's. Keep in mind the graph of refractive errors and the graph of accommodation convergence amplitude before you write that number on the prescription card. And everyone <coughs> needs convergence exercises to delay their dependence on reading glasses, no matter how old you are. So delay your presbyopia, delay the development of exotropias. Thank you very much. These are my books and they have everything in them. That's really wonderful, Samira. <laughs> today, today we've come to know why you always look young. 
You're not using press biopic glasses, and we have all started using press biopic glasses. No, so I don't. Always go back, and you are a very good teacher, and uh, I must really um, congratulate you for you. giving all of us this elaborate <laughs> talk on press biopia and teaching all our children. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. That was wonderful, <laughs> Dr. Samira. And uh, if we have any questions, we can uh, later. I ahead. think we uh, like our uh, in our professional activities also we are doing a lot of near work. Yeah. So especially like uh, operation theaters and uh, uh, slit clamp, in fact, and uh, most of our activities they involve uh, near work. So. Should we all be doing convergence exercises? Absolutely, absolutely. That's why. That's how our age is going to go younger. If she's fifty-seven, <laughs> she's saying she's not press biopic. Okay? Start so doing. Have to go younger. <laughs> so I think well, it is for our it. younger colleagues because uh, we are yeah, already wearing glasses start now. Start any any time. And uh, what about the binocular <laughs> glasses? Some people uh, prescribe. Uh, like, I have never, children, never children prescribed now. binocular glasses. Even if a child is coming from abroad or somewhere wearing binocular glasses, I tell them this is useless unless you cut down your near work, your bending, stooping. So they remove that okay. and uh, okay. they are off the binocular glasses. I haven't Thanks. had never <coughs> prescribed them. Never. Thank you. Thank you. I have a very basic question. Been wonderful. Yeah, 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 Doctor Neeraj. Okay. Uh, how frequently should we do cyclopegic retinoscopy in a child who's already using glasses, uh, let's say plus five or plus six, if there are no symptoms? Every six months, I will okay. call them the refraction in any child till the age of twelve. It has to be every six months. After the age of twelve, every year. So okay. earlier than six, there is absolutely no need. And about okay. the role of low dose atropine, uh, like what? Well, uh, uh, what uh, we I are have, doing? Uh, yeah. Yeah, myopia. Look, uh, how does myopia progress? It's it's the too much digital screen time, too much bending, stooping, and uh, unless you that, that's the cause, the cause. But if you're not removing the cause, you're treating the that is the myopia, giving atropine, giving ortho K lenses, giving multifocal lenses. You are not treating the cause. So that effect, that will fail. So what I do is I tell them you have two options, go to that and go to someone else. Or you cut down the near work, adopt proper posture and your myopia will stop progressing. And that's what happens. So for they atropine is just a, a kind of a, you just uh, are treating the effect of uh, the cause. Uh, treating the cause atropine is treating the effect. Yeah, too yeah much spending too much screen time. Uh, okay, uh, I was uh, teaching someone else today that what does atropine do? How, how does myopia progress? It's because the digital screens they emit blue light. Now we have a normal circadian rhythm. Every body, our bodies uh, physiologically have a circadian rhythm that by the time of 8, 9, 10, which is our normal sleep time, there we have a tiny pineal gland at the base of pituitary that secretes melatonin. Melatonin is the most important hormone in our body that regulates our circadian rhythm. It regulates our cardiac activity, blood pressure, heart rate, intraocular pressure and the eyeball growth. So child's uh, or your or anyone's bedtime is 10 or nine. And at that time you decide to start watching a movie on the digital screen. So that blue light, what it does is it blocks the release of melatonin. Once the melatonin is not released, melatonin, what does it do around eight and nine, 10, which is your usual sleep time? It gradually reduces your brain activity, gradually reduces your heart activity, everything till brain is all rested and, and you go to sleep peacefully all through the night. But when you start decide, okay, let me watch a movie, the blue light, it reduces, it blocks the release of melatonin, whole night there is no melatonin. You, uh, you finish your movie by 12 or one, there is no melatonin, the brain is alert, active. Then how can you go to sleep? 
the next morning it's the same cycle and it goes on and on and melatonin yeah. it keeps a balance with dopamine dopamine is a neurotransmitter that is going to block the continued growth of the eyeball so that balance is disturbed between melatonin and dopamine nighttime uh, uh, people who watch uh, digital screens at night myopia continues to progress and that Lashmira, can you stop sharing your screen please i have no no, no. Ooh, just uh, just yeah. another comment uh, like uh, in relation to this only like uh, um, we like what will happen in people who are living in say scandinavian countries or in like where there is a there was a very, yeah. very interesting stadium rhythm rhythms will get disturbed there you know because uh, they have uh, yeah. Six, what, uh, six months days and six months nights. Exactly. There was an interesting study from Norway. They had said that uh, during the winter months, children, uh, they are always indoors and they were watching digital screens and the myopia during those winter months was increasing. Then when the summers came, they started going outdoors and the myopia stopped. And uh, uh, I have a full talk on myopia maybe mm -hmm. one day. But uh, they showed with graphs that in those Scandinavian countries, this is what's happening. Six months they are indoors, myopia continues to progress. When the summers come, it stops, halts. Great. I have a doubt, Thanks sir. Lot. Yeah. Dr. Thanks. Neelima? Dr. Neelima? Yeah. Yes, sir. Dr. Next of you, next talk, please. Can I, can I take uh, one question, please? Dr. Tami? Neelima? Yes, sir. Uh, I think. Uh, Let's Dr. Shakeen Singh, Dr. Shakeen Singh wants a minute. Yes, Dr. Shakeen Singh. Uh, my question to Dr. Samira is, uh, let's go back to presbyopia. I believe a uh, convergence, uh, when you read near, we need two things. One is convergence, the second is accommodation. Accommodation is enhancement of the lens power. With the enhancement of the convergence with the exercises would not aid the accommodation. How this near work would relieve press biopia? Right. When is accommodation lost? When the lens is hardened. When is the lens hardened? It starts around 40s or so. And it's, it's, it's not fully hard. By the age of 40, you think it's fully hard? Or by the age of 35? It's getting there. It's it's there are proteins. They are cross-linking. Is it the accommodation it, range which we have, or is the convergence which we can announce and help us? Convergence and accommodation. They are both linked. They are Good there is a synkinesis in the brain. So if you yeah. enhance the convergence, it will increase the contraction of ciliary muscle, and it will increase the accommodation too. That's but not at a test per package. Lens hardening does That's not occur next before stop. 60. We'll have, we'll have to stop this. Otherwise, yeah. uh, the, Samira can go on and on and oh. on. And we have multiple questions. She, she can so, spend five hours. She can <laughs> spend any and in its number of hours. And she's a thank you, Samira. Thank you thank very you, much. Thanks. Please don't mind. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks. Thanks. So we move on to our next. Already we had Dr. Himanshu Matalia. And a very pleasant personality, the medical superintendent of our Narayan Netrale. He was already having his uh, talk, and I think it stopped in between. So, sir, we would like to have you. And I don't think you need another introduction again. You already have been introduced very well, and we all know you. I, I, I'm sorry for uh, uh, that uh, power outage. There was a power outage here, and that's why I couldn't. Uh, uh, do I have my? Uh, are you able to see yeah. my? Yes. 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 yes, sir. yes, we can see you. Yes, sir. Oh. So I'm on the third slide, that mistake number three, right? You are able to yeah. see that, right? Yeah. Perfect. Okay. So this mistake, oh, yes. uh, uh, we all love to give drops, uh, especially lubricant drop four times a day. I don't know where we have learned, but all of us are prescription C lubricant drop four times a day. Well, interestingly, the retention time of a lubricant, that's called ocular surface resident time of a drop. That depends on viscosity, it depends on blink rate, temperature of the ocular surface, pH of the drop, as well as the recipient uh, surface, uh, the tear clearance rate, adsorption of the lubricant on the surface, 
and their operation rate. And of course, no two persons can have all these factors same. Now, there was one interesting study by Anthony Brown's group from UK, and they studied direct and indirect way of ocular surface resident time of artificial tears uh, lubricant. And remember that you cannot study a molecule, complete molecule uh, on the surface, because at the fag end, the molecule would not uh, be good enough uh, to give any effect, or it may not be possible to detect that. And that's why we always talk about half-life. So if you look at the half-life of so-called very thick lubricant, which we are told that you need just once or twice a day, like sodium hyaluronate, in that study, it was five and a half minutes. And something like HPMC was 44 second half-life. And PVA, which nowadays, because of the price control in our country, all of them want to push that molecule, 39 second. That's the half-life of that molecule on your ocular surface. So whenever we give anybody like four times a day, frankly speaking, it's just psychological. It cannot stay on the surface that long. You have to give them frequent drops when you want to give them lubricant. And if you do not give them enough dosage, then you can't claim whether it was working or not working. Please remember, you must give them frequently and which can be as uh, good as two hourly also. And it can be. Uh, next, uh, if we... The mystic number four is benzalkonium chloride or back. We love to hate this guy. And that's why we say we cannot have benzalkonium chloride at any cost on the surface. This is the villain we love to hate in uh, ophthalmology. Uh, but you know what? The benzalkonium chloride toxicity is dose related. And also in a normal case, it's not as bad. In fact, if you have normal tear circulation, it gets diluted by eight fold in 30 seconds and by three minutes, it's diluted by 36 folds. So it's not there for very long time. However, I certainly don't mean that you must give benzalkonium chloride to everybody. Well, certainly somebody who already has ocular surface toxicity or using multiple drops or has punctum occlusion, well, avoid it. But otherwise, don't worry, you should be fine. The mistake number five, lubricant must have all electrolytes and all the companies would come and show that my lubricant has this that and something very very nice sodium which is required for osmolarity potassium which is required for goblet cell bicarbonate which is required for the health of the corneal epithelium interestingly the bicarbonate uh, is unstable molecule would convert into carbon dioxide and especially in the multi-dose vial it just disappear it's not going to be there now things like say now Let's take sodium, which is very important. But you know what? The sodium interaction with the carbomer, again, uh, these carbomers have come back in the market because CMC got banned in, or got price control in our country. There was a study which proved that when you add sodium to the carbomer, it actually reduces the viscosity and reduces uh, uh, the ocular surface resident time. So not always everything which you want to put inside is good. So addition of isotonic saline on carbomer actually reduces viscosity. The next mistake, higher the viscosity, better the lubricant. In fact, in our clinic, the, the person who would come or rather anywhere, anybody talking about, they'll say 1% CMC, 0.5% CMC. We just talk about the component, which is just one component in your lubricant. That's just viscoelastic agent. Well, why do we need viscoelastic agent? Well, it actually increases uh, surface retention time. Uh, higher the molecular weight, longer it will stay on the surface. But the higher molecular weight can have possible crusting on, uh, 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 on the surface, and which can lead to crusting on your eyelashes. So if your patient does not have an issue of severe dry eye, where the ocular surface retention is not an issue, and you're able to give frequent drops, if you give them one person CMC, they may not be actually happy. So not always you must give them higher viscosity uh, drops. Now, uh, when we talk about the viscoelastic agent, there are plenty of them, like what we love is CMC. But now again, what we have got back is uh, PVA and sodium hyaluronate. Now, you know, the polyols uh, or uh, the PG, PEG, glycerin, and all, all those things, 
they naturally are not viscous unless they are combined with hp guar right so i don't like to take name but maybe say to give an example cysteine ultra unless it's combined with hp guar the polyl itself does not have viscosity and when we talk about anything we'll, we'll come to uh, that later on the hp guar viscosity also is variable and when that variable viscosity comes into picture we'll see in next few slide the another mistake which we commit by not telling patient to keep the lubricants in refrigerator well why does it matter well you know what the temperature also changes the viscosity the viscosity or ocular which is which is going to decide ocular surface resident time when the temperature increases as you can see from these multiple graphs as the temperature increases the viscosity actually goes down and when we call ocular surface temperature 32 to 36 uh, degree normal there are certain molecules like carmelose hypermelose they do not have enough viscosity at 32 degree the temperature at which your ocular surface is have to have a significant ocular surface resident time so if your uh, patient is from area where the, the ambient temperature is very high the viscosity in the drop may not be good enough so it's not difficult to tell your patient to keep the drops refrigerated as simple as that which will which will at least maintain the viscosity in the uh, drop where the ambient temperature does not uh, affect it and the ocular surface temperature may not get affected as much by the ambient temperature you cannot have like 45 degree outside which becomes 45 degree on your ocular surface but that body does take care but that 45 degree the drop outside can certainly get affected by that so whenever we have chance ask them to refrigerate uh, these medication the mistake number 8 as i was telling you earlier combining a uh, drops like cysteine ultra with amino glycoside cyclopentolate as you have a case of corneal ulcer now how does that matter well now comes the role of ph as i was telling you hp guar is the main component which decides the viscosity but hp guar is also ph dependent if you have p acidic ph like anything 7 or below hp guar is liquid when it becomes basic ph or anything which is beyond 7 above 7 it actually turns gel so when you give a patient which is uh, having a microbial keratitis or for any reason you have given amino glycoside which only acts of in acidic ph because amino glycoside does not have good penetration in basic ph so if you do not have penetration of course it's not worth it now you look at this thing when you combine with hp guar if hp guar is predominant amino glycoside would not have penetration but if not the hp guar would not have viscosity and so your cysteine ultra drop would be useless now are there any other drops which has acidic ph yeah, there are certainly so many drops cyclopentolate tropicamide uh, other systems yeah thank you so so many things can actually make the surface acidic the ph becomes low at those cases when we give uh, something like drops like cysteine ultra well you know that it's not going to work it's not actually going to do anything great there's some interesting facts like pva uh, is not very compatible with solutes like sodium bicarbonate sodium uh, sulfate potassium sulfate uh, so when we combine many things uh, in a lubricant drop it's not necessary the stability would be better so sometimes our pharma company just tries to make something which is exotic and put everything inside it does not mean it's going to do well next comes the next mistake which is osmolarity well we love osmolarity and there are so many articles about osmolarity and we know that the hyperosmolarity is one of the important cause of dry eye related damage but do we know that osmolarity when we measure uh, measuring the osmometer uh, which we nowadays have has huge variability even now if you look at the graph which is given by the company published literature 
abnormal and the normal has so much of overlap. So that means in case of abnormal uh, surface like dry eye, you can have normal uh, osmolarity. And even if you are normal, sometimes you may end up in abnormal region. That's just sheer number. Now, uh, in a normal eye, if a osmolarity is high and abnormal eye osmolarity is low, then how does that help? Well, interestingly, there are articles which are published in, uh, in measurement of osmolarity in severe dry eye, mild dry eye, and normal cases. And they showed that actually the measurement in many cases was similar. Also, whether it's Sjogren syndrome, non-Sjogren dry eye, or normal cases, there were so many cases where the osmolarity levels were similar in all of them. So how does that help? So yes, treating the osmolarity would be important, but does it actually change our uh, treatment? Certainly not. Also, the osmolarity when we measure, we measure at the lower tier meniscus. But osmolarity is a dynamic thing. When you blink, the osmolarity changes in the ocular surface. The osmolarity in the center of the tear is very different from the osmolarity in the lower part of your tear meniscus, which is possibly not the, the most important part for us. There are studies which prove that even if you give hypoosmolar drop, earlier we used to get hypo tears and those kind of things, the osmolarity changes back to its pre level within one to two minutes. So giving any drop which are hypoosmolar is not going to solve the problem. So does it actually make sense to measure osmolarity in these cases? I don't think so. Coming to the 10th mistake, uh, every MGD should be treated with lippy flow warm compressor lid massage. Well, let's see something. Well, mebography is something which, uh, which has come up recently very well and we, we know now that it's very important. There are certain instruments which uh, solely do mebography. There are some topographers like Oculus Keratograph 5M, which has mebography along with the topography and many other uh, things. But irrespective, I, I used to do mebography for probably more than a decade using my autorefractometer. Well, all you need is infrared source of light. So any instrument which has infrared image, you can actually use that and it may work well. But my only problem was I had to take photograph with my mobile phone and show it to patient and I, I, I couldn't uh, take picture on my autoref. But yes, of course, you could do mebography on your autoref also. There are security cameras which are infrared cameras where well. you can use that. But why do we need mebography? Well, because till now we were taught that whenever somebody has uh, uh, blocked mebomen gland orifices, that you do warm lid massage and that helps. But when we do mebography and we find out the mebomen glands are normal, then it will certainly help. But how about this? There are no mebomen glands. So even if you keep on jumping on the eye, nothing is going to come out. Or even if you keep on doing lippy flow every day where there are atrophic glands, nothing is there. There is hardly any role. So doing certain things where it's not indicated does not help. So how do we treat such kind of patient? Well, such kind of patient require lipid-based lubricant, which unfortunately in our country, we do not have in a drop form. But we do have ointment. So Equalupium, currently we only have one company which is making, and that uh, ointment is called Equalupium. Earlier there were, used to be Lubrilac, and uh, some, uh, some time back we had some other things, but uh, well, because okay. it's not so sexy. Uh, and uh, it's by David Droid. Mm -hmm. Well, believe me, uh, somebody who has significant loss of mebomen gland, somebody who has Stephen Johnson syndrome, if you have to give only one treatment, that would be ointment based lubricant. And they would thank you throughout their life. Right? So, Whenever you have atrophic glands, you can possibly give ointment, which are paraffin-based lubricant ointment. Well, 
I said 10, but well, who doesn't like uh, a bonus? So let me give you a bonus. Now we, we are told that quantum plugs don't work. And that's typically how quantum plug market is then in India. We hardly use it. But there are studies and literature which shows, in fact, Cochrane Review is there, which showed that punctum plug helps you in symptomatic improvement, Shermer's uh, scores, as well as your TFM stability. So it's not as bad as we think. Also, it's not just about dry eye. You can use them in persistent epithelial defect. You can use them in non-healing corneal epithelium, post-PKP, superior limbic keratoconjunctivitis, filamentary keratitis, post-refractive surgery, neurotropic keratitis, uh, lid viper keratopathy, recurrent corneal erosion, so and so forth. So, so many indications are there. It's not just dry eye alone. But what's important is the sizing of the plug. If we do not know the sizing, it's not going to stay there for a long time. So how Use do we slight do that? finger traction to expose the punctum. Gently insert the tip into the punctum vertically. Once the horizontal cannuliculus has been reached, if necessary, gently turn the instrument horizontally to continue inserting past the vertical so cannuliculus. Use, uh, if the instrument can be inserted gauges. past the third ring on the tip, repeat this procedure using the larger end of the instrument, labeled 0 0.8, 0 0.9, and 1.0 millimeter. When thinking of the punctal ring is observed around the instrument, read the appropriate size from the gauge and proceed to inserting an appropriate permanent silicone plug. If the instrument can be inserted past the third line on the larger tip, a plug larger than 1.0 millimeter is required. Okay, so basically there are these gauges which are available. Uh, where you push it inside, it's conical shape. So whatever the part, last part remains out, that's the size of your punctum. So in this case, if it was 0.9, you need a large punctum plug. You can't put a medium size or small size punctum plug. Similarly, in our country, selecting the most appropriate size, size prevents migration like or punctum spontaneous punctum. extrusion. The Vera plug punctal size is a simple tool to identify the best fit plug size. In the undilated punctal opening, insert the 0.6 millimeter tip. A very tight fit or insertion indicates a small opening. Choose for a plug small. If the tip can be easily inserted, take it out, turn the size around, and insert the 0.8 millimeter tip. A loose fit or easy insertion indicates a large opening. Choose for a plug large. A snug fit for both ends indicates a medium opening. Choose for a plug medium. So I, I prefer to use uh, this Vera punctum plug sizer. So basically simple thing, on one side it's 0.6 millimeter, other side is 0.8 millimeter. When you put inside 0.6, that does not go inside, that means punctum is small. So you use small size, that may be required to dilate. When 0.6 goes inside uh, easily and 0.8 goes snugly, you can use medium size plug. And when you put 0.8, which uh, goes uh, easily, you need large size plug. Simple thing. And if you use these things, at least you would have the punctum plug, which is proper size. How do you deal with the punctum plug? Well, this is the flow chart, which I follow. Once you decide the punctum plug patient based on why you want to use. If patient has a very severe dry eye, it's better to do a punctum cautery, like severe uh, case of rheumatoid arthritis. If not, well, first and foremost, do, do a lacrimal uh, sac syringing. If it is blocked, please avoid plug. If the syringing is patent, then you can start anti-inflammatory molecules first because you do not want to put a punctum plug, which would keep the anti-inflammatory uh, pro-inflammatory tears on the ocular surface, leading to more inflammation. So you start topical steroid and topical anti-inflammatory. Next visit, put a temporary plug. Temporary plugs are very cheap. They hardly cost you probably 100 rupees, 150 rupees, not more than that. Put the temporary plug. See, if the patient has severe epiphora, well, avoid it. If patient is comfortable, then put extended plug, which can work for a longer time. If patient ends up in complication, then please avoid it again. But if patient is fine, then possibly you can either repeat the extended temporary plug or you can go for the permanent plug. It's a very simple thing and it actually works. So if rest of the world 
uses and if it works in their eye, it's something which we are not doing correctly and that's the problem. With this thing, I finish uh, my presentation and I sincerely apologize for uh, those technical hitches in between. Hope uh, you had a good time. Thank you. Good, Dr. Imanshu. Just wanted to know one thing, like when they say uh, our glaucoma drops like with RT, room temperature. Yes. So will, will that have any benefit over uh, the normal drops which are uh, being prescribed for refrigeration? No. Uh, so here, what I'm talking about is uh, a particular... Uh, a particular thing related to the viscosity. So it's basically a rheological property of a drop. Right? So if the molecule requires refrigeration or molecule does not require a refrigeration, that's a totally different thing. So if a company tells you that please do not refrigerate, I would certainly say do not do it. Here what I'm talking about is when you are giving a lubricant drop to somebody, not refrigerating is actually not helping us. Does it mean that they are getting spoiled and it's bad? No, certainly not. But remember, no. ocular surface resident time improves when the temperature reduces. So your viscosity so my, improves. My question is in uh, specific relation to latinoprost. Like yeah. uh, we have uh, uh, preparations which uh, most of them initially used to be that they need to be refrigerated. Then companies came out with uh, something called uh, this composition is room temperature stable. Okay, so, so have they added something or have they added uh, uh, a thing which makes the eye drops remain outside? Yeah. Sure, sure. So I'll stable. come. Uh, this is not purview of this talk because it's totally different thing which you are talking about. But interestingly, what normal... Uh, uh, pharma company do that when uh, post uh, marketing uh, trials they do in that they try to see if they can explore the better markets like say Asian markets where more population is there uh, there are certain limitation in our market one of them is availability of cold chain now if you say that uh, refrigerate if it reduces the number of usage then they post marketing, they try out the stability of the medication outside. And if they find that the medication stability is good enough to have a therapeutic effect, then they might tell you that, yeah, you know what, you can actually use it. Now, does it mean that it, uh, it, it would be better to refrigerate if they say that you can actually keep it out and no need to refrigerate? That's a different thing. But if they say that at room temperature, it may not have much effect. That means the refrigeration can be a little better. So you certainly don't mind refrigerating them. But this is how a pharma industry would want more uh, uh, numbers from all of us. And that's where they do such kind of thing. Yes. Nilima? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Himanshu. That's really wonderful. And uh, we should all be careful now regarding all the pharmaceutical companies when they come and tell us all these things, because we need to listen thoroughly to what all you have told us. Uh, Dr. Nilima, these pharmaceutical yeah. companies, they themselves need to understand a little bit. Yeah. yeah. One thing, which the marketing doctor, team, the marketing market team they come with. I will tell you two times a day drop. And they're crazy themselves by telling you that they are reducing their numbers and their, their marketing. I mean, uh, uh, it's been there in the signs. Why you want to do uh, that and uh, possibly kill your own business? Yeah, <laughs> that's so true. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Ivanchu, for uh, enlightening us on this topic because these are such things which, which uh, we really in day-to-day -day life, day-to-day -day routine OPDs, we need to know all these things. And in passage of time, we really get to know newer things as we go on and on. It has been really wonderful listening to you. Thank you so much, sir. Um, I think, Dr. Dhami, we need uh, move on to the next topic. Yes. Yeah, that's uh, Dr. Sachreet. 
No, I think it's Dr. Jyoti Matalia. Jyoti Matalia, yes, it's Dr. Jyoti Matalia. And uh, again, now for Dr. Jyoti Matalia, we need to really uh, appreciate how these people have been working. We all know that she's heading the pediatric ophthalmology department in Araina Nitrale. She, rece uh, she received her medical education from uh, Mumbai and uh, later on underwent her fellowship training at LBPI, completed her ICO fellowship at Wilmer Eye Institute, USA. She's currently heading the pediatric ophthalmology, strabismus and neuro-ophthalmology at Narayana Netrale. She's in charge of the postgraduate training and she has trained almost 20 fellows till date. So Dr. Jyoti, we all need to listen to you. I think you are sharing your screen. Uh, Dr. Jyoti. Her screen has come up. It says the topic she's going to deal today is evaluation and principles of management of common squint conditions. Yeah, thank you. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, Dr. Jyoti, oh, yes. can hear you. Very well. So thank you very much. I would at the outset like to thank Dr. Dhami for this opportunity and LOS and POS. And more so, this is probably the only webinar where myself and Dr. Himanshu are going to be speaking together. Otherwise, our specialities don't match. So to go on, my topic is going to be squint evaluation and principles of management. Please note this is going to be entirely a practical kind of talk because all the details and what you need to do is available in the books. And Dr. Samira has wonderfully told us about cases where we would not want to do surgery. So let's talk about cases where we really need so at the outset, I'll be talking on the basic of squint evaluation, how to reach a diagnosis, and then about five topics which I think are important. So one is infantile esotropia, one is intermittent exotropia, pattern strabismus, fourth nerve or trochlear nerve palsy, and sixth nerve or uh, abducens nerve palsy. So certain prerequisites when you're doing a squint evaluation, a proper refractive correction needs to be worn. Control fixation by using accommodative targets. Do not use torch light. That is initially to detect the squint, but for measurements, you need these instruments. Check for near as well, not only distance. These are the six steps we need to achieve a good strabismus evaluation. First, history and inspection, very important. Sensory evaluation should be done prior to doing a motor evaluation. And once with motor evaluation, you have detected how much squint is there, measure it. Do not forget to complete the eye examination, which is very, very important. And I will show you with cases how important it is. And specialized tests, like you would have a double Maddox road, FDT, FGT, et cetera, are needed in certain situations. So head posture is very important. So when a patient comes to your clinic, whether it's a child or adult, we directly make him sit on the chair, either do a slit arm examination or do a cover test. What is very important, and I keep telling my fellows, is make the patient read the chart binocularly. And as you see here, there are children, when they start reading, they start uh, assuming a head posture, which is very important. And sometimes their diagnosis is entirely just looking at the child. So when he walks into your clinic, when he sits on the chair, observe the patient. And a lot of answers you'll get just looking at him. This is followed by Hirschberg test, which is very important. Hirschberg test. In this test, the corneal light reflexes are tested by having the patient fixate a pen light at near. Normally, the reflexes should be central and symmetrical. If the reflex is displaced, it indicates misalignment. So nasally displaced reflexes indicate exotropia and temporally displaced indicate esotropia. So once you've detected that the eye is displaced, what you need to do is do the cover test where the apparently fixing eye is what you cover and then you come to know what the diagnosis is. So this cover test will measure only the tropia. It could be exotropia if the eyes come inside from outside, esotropia if the eyes move out from inside, hypertropia if the eye moves downwards, and hypotropia if the eye moves upwards. Let's see it in these examples. Exotropia when eye moves in, esotropia when it moves out, hypertropia in right eye and hypertropia in left eye. 
After this, you have to measure it. And that is done by using the Hirschberg test itself for every one millimeter displacement. Because we are assuming that the reflex is right at the center of the cornea, you could have a seven to eight degree of strabismus. And one degree is approximately two prism diopters because we will be measuring the squint using the prisms. So if the outer edge of the pupillary margin is 15 degree, midway between the pupillary margin and limbus is 30 degrees, and 45 degrees at the limbus. Like for example, in this, the right eye is almost out short of the limbus, so 40 degrees. This is outer edge of the pupil in the right eye, so 15 degrees isotropia. In this case, the left eye is mid less than midway, so it is about 24 degrees. So all this is subjective. What you need to understand is that if you've done the Hirschberg and you have detected the amount of degree, you can start your examination using prisms by multiplying this by two. So you have an estimate about where you should start doing the calculation. Now, a little bit note on what about prisms. Now, we know there are five faces as seen here, and the two transparent surfaces are what we use for measurement. You can either use a prism bar as seen here or loose prisms. Anything is fine, whatever you're comfortable with it. With it. Remember, you have to hold the apex of the prism in the direction of the deviation, but you will always write in terms of the base. So even if you're holding the prism inwards for an isotropia and outward for exotropia, you will write it as base in. And for exotropia, base out for isotropia, base down for hypertropia, and base up for hypertropia. So this is how you'll uh, write it, but you'll put it according to the apex. So, and also note that the base should be parallel to the sagittal axis, very important. The other things that you have to understand with prisms is that when you're using horizontal prisms and you need to use two of them because the squint is very large, you have to split between the two eyes. You cannot put one over the other. The other thing is, but a vertical and a horizontal prisms can be stacked as, as is shown. Now let's go to individual of the squint. No, no, not. I don't know. Um, Dr. Jyoti can uh, take over from uh, my laptop. So we have major power uh, outage here. So I'll share her screen uh, here. Yeah. Jyoti, which uh, screen? Uh, no, no. Show your screen. Huh. I got it from there. Um. Yeah, share screen. Wait a minute. Come down, come down. Down. Is it wrong? Down, down. This is like last class. Can you hear me now? Yeah, 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 very well. So we'll be starting from esotropia. When you see a patient with esotropia, one thing that you first, like in this case, it's obvious, but otherwise you need to first rule out few things. Flat nasal bridge as seen here, epicanthal fold, because this child is a pseudo isotropic. And how would you confirm that? By doing a cover test. When you cover either eye, you will notice that there's no movement seen 
indicating that there is absolutely eyes are straight. Then other important consideration is when you see a child, assess it by checking monocular vision and then cyclorefraction is a must. Like for example in this, and that also we've heard from Dr. Samira that when you have a patient like this, if you refract him, you sometimes can correct the squint completely. So this is very important before pushing and running for surgery. Now this child is had infantile esotropia, which means squint or esotropia less than one year of age. And what we noticed is at this age, when he came, other than doing just the evaluation, as, a, as I said, one of the six important steps is do a complete eye examination. He had a papilledema, which is very important and should not be missed because when we realized this and referred him, he had a craniopharyngioma. So never forget to look at the fundus after you finished a good refraction, which is very important. So other important aspect in children is that root, rule out retinoblastoma because that also can be there. So examining the fundus is an imp imperative and uh, integral part of your examination. So once you have that, correct them by giving glasses and ampliopia treatment should be started. What we use that will allow to attain good and equal vision in both eyes. And this is important because the amblyopia management will even continue after screen surgery. So what are the surgical principles? Timing as early as possible, less than two years of age. And what you need to know here is that provided you've got two reproducible measurements on two separate occasions, you can easily go in for the surgery. But many a times my friends, my pediatrician colleagues tell the patients, don't worry, you can wait till you become an adult. And that is not acceptable because we need the child to develop fusion. In fact, children who have infantile esotropia get operated less than one year of age by eight to 10 months. But remember, just because you have to get it operated, you just don't go and do it. You have to have two reproducible measurements and you should be sure of what you're doing. Also, you have to have equal vision in both eyes during which time you can give amblyopia pat or patching to them so that you maintain vision equally in both eyes. What are the options? Bimedial recession, but aim for orthotropia. Overcorrect and partially accommodative esotropia. So what is partially accommodative? Accommodative esotropia is esotropia, which is completely corrected by glasses. Like I showed you, where you wear glasses, squint is gone. That is the ET is corrected. But sometimes it's only partly, partially corrected. And if it is partially corrected, the part which is residual can be then operated upon. But in these cases, you have to aim for a little more exotropia because you can then balance out the residual one by reducing the power of the glasses. Also, if the child has amblyopia in one eye, then you can do recession and resection in that eye. So this is a child who came pre-operatively and post-operatively. Why this was at about 15 months and he was operated and this is how his eyes are. So remember that two reproducible measurements on two separate occasions is a must. Early surgery has to be done to promote and restore normal binocular single vision and achieve stereopsis. So let's look at this. This is exotropia, but again, on what basis? Because the nasal reflex, that is the corneal reflex, sorry, the corneal reflex is nasal and that's why. But I said, before seeing the patient and jumping or trying surgery, do a cover test. And this cover test will show you that there is no movement when you cover either eye and therefore this is pseudo-exotropia. So in any case of squint, first rule out those which are appear to be a squint. So once you know it's an exotropia, if it's a constant exotropia, you definitely operate upon if it's intermittent exotropia, then you would select those cases which really need to be operated upon. Like, for example, in children, if the home control, that is squinting, is more than 50% of the waking hours, in the OPD, there's a loss of near stereopsis and there's a poor control. Like, for example, we have a multiple classification and multiple scoring, but what is commonly used is a Newcastle scoring. If it's more than three, then we can definitely consider surgery. What are the options? Now, these are the various types of uh, intermittent XC. So one is basic type, which means the exotropia is same for distance and near, in which case one eye, LR recession with MR resection can be done. Divergence excess, which is more for distance than near, but that can be true, in which case you can definitely do bilateral LR recession, but it's simulated, then you can do only one eye, means appears to be because of a strong convergence. In that case, you can do only one eye recess resection. Conversion insufficiency, which we mean that the medial rectus are not very good, you can do bilateral MR resection or a unilateral LR, LR resection plus MR resection. So a patient like this underwent surgery for the XT in the left eye and post-operatively is good. So the take-home point here is post-operatively for exotropia, aim for orthotropia to less 
then five pd of isotopia in children because we don't want them go to go into a microtopia or a long standing et if it's an adult then aim for five to eight pd isotopia why because a post operative diplopia will is used to stimulate the fusion versions and the eyes will straighten out because the success rate of surgery in intermittent next is only 75% so it's better to keep them a little more isotropic now let me just show you a few uh, surgical steps about how to do it so i use a phonics incision after you've made about 7 mm away you use a hook to pick up and this is the pole test the tip should come to the limbus in indicating the entire muscle is hooked and i also use a three fixation technique as you can see three point fixation this will prevent the muscle from sagging since i do phonics incision i use this rectangular mark because you don't know where the globe is turning and this will ensure that the muscle is sutured properly i use markers as mentioned here and you see the muscle is completely come up without a sag looking at uh, resection this in this you can see that the muscle is hooked after that i've marked it to the desired i want 5 mm so after marking it what i do is again three fixation take a central knot that will prevent this from sagging and then two interlocking sutures on either side this is followed by a clamp and a little bit of cautery so that that forms a stump and does not sag and then the extra part is removed of the muscle and you see that as we suture back in position you'll see that is the muscle has completely come up giving you a better effect so you can try any technique this is the technique that i tend to use now coming to patterns to business this we are talking about a or b pattern and you should never miss it because a child with or an adult with isotropia or exotropia can have a pattern and we need to operate it in the same sitting if that's there otherwise it will show up after surgery and we really need an additional surgery so how do you pick up the pattern before that let's just understand the surgical principles one horizontal deviations needs to be corrected independently you have to confirm an oblique overaction because that can be the reason for the pattern and weaken if necessary and if that's absent then you do a vertical transposition of horizontal muscles which is called male that is a mnemonic which means mr to the apex of the a or the v pattern so let's understand what is a pattern a pattern when there's a divergence of the eyes the eyes are moving out like an a in down gaze which should be more than 10 prism diopters and that indicates a bilateral superior oblique overaction v pattern on the other hand is a convergence as you see the eyes are converging down which is more than 15 prism diopters from up gaze to down gaze and that is because of a bilateral inferior oblique overaction so for that we need to check how these obliques are overaction so let us understand an inferior oblique is an elevator but a superior oblique is a depressor unlike how the name shows an inferior oblique forms when chest when tested forms about 45 degrees angle to the horizontal whereas superior oblique in down gaze forms a 45 degrees angle so how do you check these obliques in adduction like in this case if you're looking at the left eye you're checking the obliques when that eye is adducted and this is for the left inferior oblique to look for overaction this position is for left superior oblique for its overaction for the right eye you look when that eye is adducted and this position is for the right inferior oblique and this for the right superior oblique so when you talk about oblique overactions you're talking about high how up the eye is going not how much in so as you can see the right eye is significantly up compared to this eye that indicates inferior oblique overaction in that eye whereas here you will see that the superior oblique is depressing more so this is how you differentiate an oblique overaction if it's going more in then you're talking about a horizontal muscle problem like a medial rectus or lateral rectus but going up is an inferior oblique overaction down is a superior oblique overaction also the other way to confirm that is by looking at the fundus so normally the fovea is at the lower one third as seen in both cases when that goes below as you can see here it indicates excyclotorsion and this patient would then have a v pattern if you find incyclotorsion where the fovea is going upwards then that patient will have a a pattern so let's look at the case to understand how do we reach a diagnosis you look at this is a nine gaze appearance you look at the central primary position and you will see that the patient has isotropia also this isotropia is increasing in down gaze compared to up gaze so we know this is a classical v pattern isotropia now we have to look at the eyes in adduction to see if there's an oblique overaction and here you will see that the left eye is going up in this position and the right eye is going in this position indicating a bilateral inferior oblique overaction and this is more evident when you see in these two positions so this is how you would confirm that the patient has oblique overaction and tackle it at the same sitting so here you would do bilateral medial recession medial rectus recession for the isotropia and inferior oblique uh, recession or myectomy 
for the inferior oblique overaction and the same sitting. So let me show you some steps about how to hook the inferior oblique. You can do myectomy or you can do recession. That's your choice. Take an inferotemporal phonics incision. Hook both lateral and inferior recti as shown. Identify the triangle made by the vortex vein, sclera and the muscle. Just lateral to the vortex vein, place a small hook. Place it flat against the sclera. Gently slide the hook beneath the inferior oblique muscle until the inferior oblique is engaged. Isolate the whole muscle by placing the muscle hooks on either side. Look muscle. for any unhooked muscle fiber. Case. Again, in primary position, we are seeing an exotropia. And this exotropia is increasing in down gaze. So giving a pattern of A. So our diagnosis is now A pattern exotropia. As I said, if you have an A pattern, look for superior oblique overactions. And you look for the eye in the adducted position. And as you can see here, there's a depression of the right eye in adduction and depressing right eye in, sorry, left eye in adduction. That is the falling eye, that's what you say. So this, again, is a case of bilateral superior oblique overaction. So here, I would tackle the exotropia separately and superior obliques, I would tackle separately. So just to show you how you should hook the superior oblique muscle. Take a superotemporal phonics incision, hook the superior rectus muscle, Look for the glistening white tendon beneath. Use a small muscle hook to pick up all the fibers of the superior oblique tendon. Place a small hook underneath the isolated tendon and cut the muscle along the insertion. For posterior 4 5 tenectomy, split the tendon carefully at the anterior 1 5th and posterior 4 5th junction. So here only the posterior 4 5 tenectomy as shown here. the muscle which causes the A pattern. The anterior fibers are intorting and that you leave ahead if you want to increase, uh, improve extorsion or intorsion in acquired cases of superior oblique. So that part you've left behind and this is how you tackle the superior oblique overaction. Now look at this case. Again, exotropia and primary position, but it's increasing in up gaze and it's also increasing in down gaze, which is an X pattern exotropia. Now let me tell you that if you have a situation like this, you cannot have superior and inferior obliques overacting in the same eye which in case is because the lateral rectus are too tight and that gives this kind of an appearance. So all you need to do is only operate on the lateral rectus. So what are the, to summarize the surgical principles for combatant squints, because these are all squints which are happening in the same gaze, except for AV patterns, aim to correct alignment to within 10 PD orthotropia. So many a times you have a squint like this with 50 PD, you would operate and now you would get a 25 PD. So a lot of doctors feel, no, it's fine. You have corrected it, no? Cosmetically, patient is looking much better. But no, that is not, should not be your endpoint. Your endpoint should be exactly within 10 PD and that should be perfect. So never leave a squint in between because you're not giving him any binocularity by leaving him in between. So now let's come to the cranial nerve policies. A little bit of what is important and how to differentiate them from the non-paralytic, what we discussed till now. What important you have to know is how do you differentiate? Look for ductions because there is limitation. And you also have to do a force uh, duction test, which I said, one of the specialized tests to tell you whether the muscle is tight or not. A primary deviation versus secondary deviation, pass pointing and floating saccades. And these all will help you detect that this is paralytic and not just a normal non-paralytic squint. So when you look at extraocular motility, you will see there's a limitation, which is seen. There is like in this patient, there is an underaction of the left superior oblique on this side, but not on this side. This, on the other hand, there is no adduction which is seen. And here also no elevation or no depression. So this is a classical third nerve palsy. But before you decide, what you have to do is do your ductions, which means close the eye which is normally moving and confirm whether the eye actually is moving or not. Because sometimes there may be a limitation because the other eye is actually strongly moving. If now you continue to say there is no movement, means the patient actually has a paralytic issue. That is what you need to do. Secondly is primary versus secondary. Now this patient has a left six nerve palsy. So he's fusing, sorry, fixing with the right eye. You see a small left isotropia. But if you make him fixate with the left eye, as you can see, through this Peelman's occluder, you can see that the amount of ET is significantly high, telling you that the secondary deviation is much more. And that can happen in paralytic squints only. Then floating saccades. Check floating saccades. Saccades are tested by asking the patient to switch fixation rapidly between two targets kept at the right and left side. In a patient with palsy, 
normal rapid saccades will be replaced by slow floating saccades. In this patient with left sixth nerve palsy, note the floating saccades so in the left eye. this is how it floats and that is a diagnosis that this is paralysis. Pass pointing. It can be tested by asking the patient to point with his finger the object viewed in the presence of paresis giving extra innovation to the hand resulting so in pass pointing. How do you manage these cases? You treat the cause, that is intracranial pathology. You observe and watch for spontaneous recovery for the limitation uh, of ductions to improve. And usually in six months, they tend to improve. So you can wait and watch. But you have to follow up them up for progression, resolution and stabilization. Like for children less than 14 years, no neurological signs. You can initially see two weekly, then monthly, then up to three months. Young adults look for risk factors why this developed. More than 40 years, diabetic, hypertension, you should screen them. And if it's more than 65, then giant cell arteritis. If there is an increasing misalignment, no resolution, recurrence, neurological signs, then you need to do an MRI and send him for a neurological workup. So let's come to individual palsies. This is the fourth nerve palsy. What you should know regarding this first, whether it's congenital or acquired because both would avoid unnecessary investigation, acquire only those you will treat, and surgical modality is different. Whether it's unilateral or bilateral, because that is also different in both cases. Cause is not important. Congenital would present since birth, and acquired would mostly be commonly as trauma, followed by, as it said, in elderly, it could be diabetic or blood pressure, where there's a decreased blood supply going to the fourth nerve. So let's look at this. The patient, as I said, important inspection, has a head tilt. And then when you look at his extraocular motility, you will see that there's a left eye inferior oblique overaction. The superior ob oblique underaction is seen in the same eye. And that in the other eye is seen to be overacting. So many a times people try to operate on this eye. So never do that. Why is the superior oblique overacting in this eye? Because the same, uh, the inferior rectus in this eye is not depressing enough due to superior rectus contracture in this eye. So you need to actually tackle the inferior oblique, the superior oblique or the superior rectus to deal with your fourth nerve palsy. Other important pathognomic test is of uh, Belchowski head tilt test. You notice that you tilt this child's head on the right, this hypertropia increases. Whereas here you will see there is no movement. And that is very classical because superior oblique in this eye, which is an intotter, is not acting. Only superior rectus is acting, which causes the eye to come up. So this is a pathognomic test for fourth nerve palsy. For acquired cases, you have to measure the cyclodeviation because these patients come with torsion issues. And for that, you use double Maddox rod in your trial frame and see how much of rotation because they have excyclotropia. And if it's more than 10 degrees, then it's a bilateral esopalsy. So these are cases who will come suddenly. The other classical way of those coming and telling you that normally I'm fine, but when I try to walk down the stairs or when I'm reading a newspaper, which is seen in elderly, I'm seeing double. So this indicates that this has affected your superior oblique muscle and most likely, you have to in investigate him for an ischemic cause like a hypertension or a heart disease, etc. What are the indications for surgery? In congenital cases, abnormal face turn, for which a very important tool which you can use is a family album tomogram. At any age, you can look at this, see the child, you can see the head tilt is there right from birth. Then to prevent facial asymmetry. For acquired cases, deviation in primary position, diplopia and torsion you need to handle. What are the principles to re-equilibrate the active forces and therefore prefer weakening? Weaken the muscle whose maximum action is in that diagnostic position with maximum hypertropia, which I mean is if there's a left superior oblique palsy and the patient has maximum deviation here, like I showed you the child, you will do a left inferior oblique weakening. In this case, you will do a left superior oblique tuck. You just have to tuck the muscle. Contralateral inferior rectus recession, you can do in the other eye. If there's a restriction, which I said, caused by contracture, you can do a superior rectus recession. Weaken an oblique corrects the hypertrophy and adduction. So if the patient has something like this in the entire adduction, as I show you, showed you, because obliques are basically primarily have, a, have maximum action in that, you need to, it corrects the hypertrophy in that junction. Weakening of rectus muscle, entire horizontal field and an abduction by operating on that, this particular area will be corrected. Operate on more than one vertical muscle in the same surgery if the deviation is more than 15 to 18 PD. However, an acquired bilateral, it is different. Very large excitio torsion, Harada Ito or modified Harada Ito. Harada Ito is the same surgery I showed you in superior oblique. The anterior one-fourth, I had not cut. 
in this hara dido you will pull that and put it near your lateral rectus without touching the posterior forefoot so that is a way to take tacular excytotorsion because those fibers are only for intorsion excytotorsion if it's less than 10 degrees you can directly operate on your inferior oblique or on your inferior rectus i shifting them so this is a patient pre operatively post operatively did fine we operated on his inferior oblique and superior rectus because there was a contracture and you can notice that this excytotorsion whether you can see the fovea below your disc has now stabilized post surgery and the last part is the six nerve palsy or the paresis let's look at this patient look at the left eye you will see there is an abduction limitation by minus 4 and the floating saccades which are give away that this is a six nerve palsy so when you have a patient like this there is a particular flow chart that you can follow because there could be six types first if it's isolated if it is not isolated means with associated other cranial nerves then you need to do a neuroimaging and evaluate for localization which could be a third nerve fourth nerve and sixth nerve if it is isolated get a traumatic history if it is uh, there you know the diagnosis if not then again look at old photographs confirm it's congenital or not also depending on the age if that's not then look out for vasculopathic uh, factors look at ischemic workup if it is non not vasculopathic that means it's a non vasculopathic type of six nerve if it's vasculopathy you can observe and usually they resolve over about 4 to 6 months and you need to wait if uh, it does not it improves it confirms the diagnosis but if it doesn't then it's a progressive unresolved and both the number 5 and 6 together if persistent you need to do neuroimaging and further evaluation and how do you manage them one in children prevent amblyopia so encourage face turn and alternate eye patching patching will not only relieve the diplopia but prevent a muscle contracture also in adults you need to buy time before surgery if it's a smaller squint then you can use prisms which are fresnels you can attach it on the glass itself and but you need to understand that it will keep on changing as a time or it tends to improve but somebody who is in a profession and needs to correct the glasses immediately there is no other alternative botulinum toxin can be given like for mr muscle in six nerve palsy and lr in third nerve palsy you can be given so uh, what are the other important things you look for the limitation of abduction it could be going beyond midline and stops short of midline if it's going beyond midline you can easily know that the lateral rectus function is there so you can do a mr resection with lr resection if it is stopping short of midline do a fgt that is a first generation test for your lateral rectus to see if there's a strength in that muscle or not because if there's no strength you cannot operate that muscle you are left with very less less muscle to operate so there's no strength directly do mr resection with transposition but if the fgt shows that there is moderate strength you can do the same thing mr resection and lr resection remember that there is fdt which is a force duction test could be typed due to mr contracture if that happens you need to relieve the contracture come what may that's the first thing you do before doing anything else so let me quickly show you three small short cases about how to manage this is a case one who had a sixth and seventh nerve palsy he was not keen for doing anything so i gave him botox and you see over one month five months and one year how the isotropia has reduced and the abduction is also improved so from this position he became significantly less to only 18 pd base out so when we fix, at one year we realized that there is fdd mildly positive for the right eye medial rectus we went ahead and did a right eye medial rectus resection and you see post operatively he is doing well so what i want to showcase here is that you can give botox in the interim period it reduces the amount of contracture and then you can operate on just one muscle case 2 is about one patient who came with a very large isotropia about 60 65 uh, base out et there was a mild mr contracture but when we did the fgt the strength for the lateral rectus the tug was felt which means 60% of and always remember when you do the fgt the first generation test it should be the amount of strength compared to the other eye which was good enough so i knew since there was a strength left we will uh, can operate on that eye so he therefore underwent left medial rectus resection with left lateral rectus resection indicating and this patient if you can see is now orthotropic in primary position also note that though there is a limitation of lateral rectus here and also medial rectus what we have achieved in this is improving the field of binocular vision so it's not about how much limitation came back but because the field is expanded he is now able to move around in a diplopia free movement and can do his normal activities this is another important indication of doing the surgery now when you cannot do the lateral rectus you have to go ahead and do transposition which could be hamelsheim so where you are splitting the muscle and getting it say you split the superior rectus half and get it to your lateral rectus you can do it with an adjustable or jensen where you put this but this is no longer done because this suturing around your muscles can cause strangulation 
if you're doing full tendon, it's difficult to do MR recession at the same time. So they tend to give Botox or you just do this. If there is no MR recession, you've done it already. And now you want to do only a transposition where you get the entire muscle to your lateral rectus like this, followed by a foster augmentation. So this is a quick uh, video to show you how we are doing. Just one minute. Right. So this is a patient who we did an MR recession, but because we did, we decided to do a partial tendon transposition or Hummel shines along with a foster augmentation. So note that I am splitting the muscle. This is the inferior rectus. As I'm splitting, I'm trying to leave few ciliary arteries here because I don't want this patient to develop anterior segment ischemia. Again, the same principle stays three point fixation. Now I'm doing the superior rectus also, the same splitting note. Again, vessels to be left in this area so that you can allow the patient to have some vessels left. So after I've done this, I'm cutting the two muscles on either sides and getting them to the lateral rectus. This is my lateral rectus. I've sutured them marking around the spiral of trilogs, which means all along the shape of the muscle. Uh, and then the muscle is now got in and sutured at that point. So only the half tendon is got here. So after I've done the suturing, you see the muscle is coming right in this position. One, the same thing I'm done down. And after that, I've used a foster augmented suture, which is eight millimeters behind. So this part of the superior rectus, which has come all the way, I have now sutured a part of it to my lateral rectus or to the sclera directly, not lateral rectus, sclera, and pass through the muscle so that this will give enhanced augmented effect onto my lateral rectus. So this will allow the patient to basically do uh, see better and abduct the eye better. So for this patient who came, this kind of uh, large esotropia, he is perfectly okay by doing the MR recession and the transposition in this side. So I want to summarize by saying, individualize your cases in paralysis. Stage procedure is needed and multiple surgeries have to be explained. Address patients' expectations and explain to them that limitation of ocular rotation will persist. Incompetence will be seen in different gazes. We'll treat only primary and near position. We cannot be uh, heroic and say we can do everything. What the patient needs in primary and near for reading and walking is what's important. And we try to deal the option of field of binocular single vision so that he can actually move in an area of diplopia free. Thank you very much for your patient listening. Thank you, Dr. Jyoti. It has been a wonderful talk, a very elaborate topic you've chosen. And of course, worth mentioning. Wonderful job. So thank you so much for presenting all your cases. Uh, I think it's, uh, that's why we need to say that your area of interest, not only in pediatric, but you deal all kinds of individual cases also along with neuro-ophthalmology, your uh, interest in teaching, your passion, that shows in your talk also, Jyoti. So I really congratulate both of you. Thank you. Thank you so much. So I think of, uh, we move on to our last top talk today, and that's uh, Dr. Sachreet. Uh, I think, are you ready, Dr. Sachreet? Uh, yes, ma'am, I'm ready. Yeah, so Dr. Sachreet is going on, uh, she'll be speaking on worst case scenarios post squin surgery. And uh, I think that'll be the last talk for the session to, for today's webinar. Okay. Uh, over to you, Dr. Sachreet. You can okay. please. Good, e good evening, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Thami and uh, Ludhiana of Thalmic Society and uh, Punjab of Thalmic Society for giving me this platform to share a few of my cases. I'm presenting here a few of the difficult cases in Squin, how we managed them and how we plan to manage. Am I audible to everyone? Yeah, yeah. Oh, so yes, continue. So, in difficult cases, the perfection is a very subjective term. In many of these cases, we don't aim for an orthotropia or a binocular single vision. But a perfect outcome is what we have aimed for, actually. So in the worst or the difficult cases, is first is a muscle loss. Actually, there are three different entities. One is muscle loss, muscle slip, and muscle rupture. Muscle loss is when muscle is actually lost. Muscle is recoiled through the tenon capsule and gone into the posterior orbital cavity. Muscle slip or muscle disinsertion is when the muscle is slipped or within the sheet or muscle is disinserted from its inserted side and it is inserted 
somewhere posteriorly over the sclera only it is not gone into the posterior orbital cavity and muscle rupture is when muscle is actually torn now apart from the medial rectus rest all the muscles are interconnected with each other through intramuscular septum so if medial rectus is lost it is very difficult to get it back but rest of the muscles if you have not done a extensive dissection there is a good amount of chance that you will get them back now before going into the details of this you need to understand few things that the muscles they have origin at annulus of zin then they move forward in the tenon's capsule and just beyond the equator they pierce the tenon's capsule and come over the superior surface of sclera so whenever the muscle is lost and you are trying to get back after equator you will not find the muscle over the globe you have to go into the tenon space to get the muscle back whenever acutely or on table muscle is lost everyone has a tendency to move the globe in opposite direction and to get the muscle back the the first point is if a muscle is lost do not pull the eye away from the detached muscle muscles have a very high contractile power they have a very high recoiling property more you try to pull it away from the detached muscle more it will go into the orbital cavity so first thing is do not pull the eye away from the detached muscle and after equator do not dissect on the over the globe do not try to find muscle along the globe or dissect towards the apex of the orbit you have to open the tenons and search the muscle over there so in my first case this gentleman we underwent a right eye medial rectus dissection in his childhood and had a residual or a consecutive exotropia one year back he underwent a left eye surgery medial rectus dissection and resection and still he is having exotropia now if we see here carefully he is having a loss of adduction here and on attemptic adduction he is having increased palpebral fissure height also so most probably this is a lost muscle whenever you are planning to explore such a case you have to go with the two plans one is in case you find out the muscle you will definitely put it back but in case you don't find any muscle you have to be ready with the transposition also we went ahead we explored this case and when you are opening such a case be very gentle with your dissection and try to find out any clue this is a pseudo tendon which we found we thought maybe this is the remnant of a old sheath and we traced it back you really have to be gentle with your dissection because in case inadvertently you cut it you will not have any area to dissect it after pulling this pseudo tendon in the tenon sheath we got this muscle back i'll just so here it will be a bit clearer see this is a pseudo tendon this is going to be very friable tissue the moment you find any clue or any residual of sheath or muscle put a suture over there do not cut it and try to trace backwards from here we have put a suture over that pseudo tendon now we are opening the tenon's cavity and in the tenon's we have found out this muscle we put it back on the inserted side and immediately post operative patient is having a wood adduction and orthotropy now second thing is a ruptured muscle when actually muscle is torn i was not having a case of ruptured muscle on table i picked up a case of post trauma this gentleman had a road traffic accident and came with a diplopia inferior movement restricted ct orbit was suggestive of periorbital edema and no fracture was there and surprisingly they have not mentioned anything about the muscles we explored this case and on table first we found this lump of a tissue at inserted site of inferior rectus this is actually a torn muscle muscle has a very high contractile power this can be 4 to 5 mm of muscle itself we are gently retracting the tissue and we are not doing any sharp dissection we looked at the globe we have not found out the muscle now we have to explore the tenons now in such cases do not do a sharp dissection use blunt instruments and try to find out the muscle in case of excessive bleeding you will not able to find out the muscle see here we got the muscle when you got the muscle try not to pull the globe away from this side because there this will go into the orbital cavity put a suture and try to get it out from this space and we are inserting it back over the torn muscle now immediately post operative still he is having a hypertrophia diplopia and limited inferior movement now such cases they have a lot of inflammation and we don't even expect them to be immediately okay by next day we gave them a lot of anti inflammatory and after one month he is having a fully gain movements in fear inferior and no diplopia the pseudo hypertrophic appearance which you are seeing here is just because of inferior scleral show 
now the third thing is a muscle slip muscle slip is when muscle is actually slipped back and is inserted to sclera posterior either within the sheath or without the sheath this girl underwent a left eye esotropia surgery somewhere else and came as a case of consecutive exotropia with dvd if we see carefully she is having a decreased palpebral fissure height we thought maybe someone has done a excessive resection of the lateral rectus and that is causing this decreased palpebral fissure height out so we took it as a simple case of consecutive exotropia and we went ahead with a lateral rectus resection immediately post operative patient was doing fairly good he was she was having a bit of dvd but otherwise she was orthotropic now after 15 days she came back with a acute onset of esotropia with limited abduction what would have happened in 15 days now either the muscle is slipped back it was a tight resected muscle which we have recessed or muscle is gone back or it's a lost muscle we immediately took her back and this is the original site of lateral rectus 7.7 mm from its inserted site and here you can see our suture marks we did a 4.5 mm recession at back time and this is around about 10 to 15 mm gone back now such cases where it was already resected muscle to get them back and putting it over the inserted site is a very difficult thing because it's a tight muscle so in such cases where you feel the muscle is tight results are unpredictable preferably do a adjustable surgery if you see here we are doing a adjustable surgery i am putting a half bone knot here and if you see carefully we have put a suture over the conjunctiva that makes, makes us the things very easier for the next day when you are doing adjusting for opposing the conjunctiva so this is a adjustable surgery and this is one month post operative not only she is orthotropic if you see carefully even her palpebral fissure height is better cosmetically she is good and she is having a good abduction movement now now points to remember in muscle loss muscle slip or muscle rupture is in acute cases do not pull the globe in opposite direction of lost muscle in acute cases in chronic cases there will be a lot of fibrosis so you can do it but not in acute cases more you pull more you are sending the muscle back into the orbital cavity be gentle with your dissection try to find out the clue of a old surgery in cases of acute uh, muscle loss if there is excessive bleeding you will not be able to find out your lost muscle be patient with your results in such complicated cases you don't get your immediately good results and wherever possible do a adjustable surgery now second thing is anterior segment ischemia we all know the blood circulation of the anterior segment is by ciliary vessels out of this 70% is by the anterior ciliary vessels and 30% by the long posterior ciliary vessels now out of this 70% there are total seven in number one on the lateral rectus and two each on inferior medial and superior rectus whenever we are doing a squint surgery or any surgery over the muscle we are definitely compromising the blood circulation of anterior segment so never attempt to touch more than two recti in a single go in fact when you are doing a recti surgery on two adjacent muscles the chances of having anterior segment ischemia is more as compared to doing the opposite muscles surgery there are multiple ren number of number uh, risk factors which can cause anterior segment ischemia but broadly we have divided into three categories first is age second is how the eye condition is any compromised eye post uveitic eye multiple eye previous eye surgeries or you are touching the multiple recti in a single go and third thing is associated vasculopathy where the blood supply circulation is already compromised so be very careful in such cases in such cases if you really want to go for a surgery do a ciliary vessel sparing surgery just before the equators the muscle the vessels which traverse through the muscle mass before the equator they come over the superficial surface of the muscle and they are very loosely connected to the muscle so after equator you can just separate out these vessels gently and do the surgery beneath these ciliary vessels and you will have a, your blood circulation intact now in such gentleman in this he was having a post uveitic case band shape keratopathy was there already a compromised eye and the second person he was advised for enucleation with a process is i which he was not keen he was just concerned about he wanted a bit better appearance he is having a dvd with prethysis we went ahead we did a ciliary vessel sparing surgery now whenever you are doing a ciliary vessel surgery do it under high magnification you need to spare these vessels and do not do a sharp 
dissection. I am using just a plain forceps and separating this vessels from the muscle mass. When you get a plain, put a suture, retract these vessels back. See, we are very gentle. We are actually not cutting them. We are just separating the vessels from the muscle. Once you have separated, this is we are cutting out the muscles. And this is our vascular fronds. They are now intact and muscle is here. So whatever the type of spoon surgery you want to, you can go ahead. We are doing our adjustable surgery over here. But circulation is intact. Now, immediately after this, this patient is absolutely okay, orthotropic, and he is much better. Now, at least he doesn't need any enucleation. Now, squint with a thyroid eye disease. Thyroid is an inflammatory autoimmune disease, and it causes a restrictive strabismus. Restrictive, I mean to say, here the muscles lose their tendency to relax. Most commonly affected muscles are inferior rectus, followed by medial rectus, superior rectus, and lateral rectus. In fact, the muscles become so tight that they give a pseudoparesis or appearance of the antagonist muscle. For example, inferior rectus becomes so tight that it gives appearance that superior rectus is having a palsy. Whenever you are doing surgery in such cases, do force duction test and check for the tightness of the muscle. Plan surgery after a stable phase of at least six months, if possible, maybe more than a year. And preferably do adjustable surgery. Results are highly unpredictable in these cases. Now this girl, we did a surgery for DVD in her case. She was having this right eye emblapic eye six years back and she was doing fairly good. And two years back, she developed hyperthyroidism. She came back with a lid flare and hypotropia. And pretty was just to a very tight inferior rectus. We waited for a year. The hypotropia was persistent, stable, and we did an inferior rectus recession. We did on adjustable, we did a six millimeter of inferior rectus recession. Now, even after doing a six millimeter of recession, still the hypotropia is persistent. So in such cases, it's very difficult to get a orthotropic or a well aligned eyes. We gave her a choice for superior rectus recession of the other eye, which she reclined. She was just worried about her lid flare. We went ahead and we did just a canthoplasty and she was showing a good results. So in thyroid eye disease with squint, surgery should be done only in a stable phase. Do recessions, preferably do not do resections as these are fibrotic muscles and results will be very unpredictable. Muscles are very tight. Be very careful when you are disinserting. If you put a too much of attraction, you can actually injure the sclera. Very tight inferior rectus can cause, see all the muscles have secondary and the tertiary actions also. Any tight muscle who is, whose primary action is being increased, secondary and tertiary will also increase. So if the inferior rectus is very tight, that itself was, can cause a isotropia. So rather than jump into inferior rectus recession along with the medial rectus, first check the tightness of both the muscles, whether medial rectus is actually tight or not, or only if it's an inferior rectus tight, and then you plan the surgery. As results are very unpredictable, do adjustable surgery. And whatever the residual diplopia is there, you can always correct it by prisms. So in nutshell, the complicated squints always have to be well planned. Whenever you are doing such cases, do force duction test, check the tightness of the muscle, do force generation test, see how much the power muscle is having. Wherever possible, do the adjustable surgery. Respect the anatomical, uh, respect anatomical planes do not do inadvent dissection because more you do dissection, more you are cutting the intramuscular planes, you are actually going into some other side effect. Always be ready for a plan B. In case you don't fight the muscle, in case the muscle is lost, you should be ready with the transposition either in a same go or the patient should be counseled well in this. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sachri. It has been wonderful listening to you also. And I thank would you. on the outset thank Dr. Dhami, uh, Dhami Eye Care, the whole team, LOS, yes, on behalf Hello. of US also, uh, everybody. It has been wonderful. Wonderful. Dr. This Neelima. webinar Neelima. has been wonderful. Now, Neelima, uh, let's have uh, comments from Dr. Ashwini. Yes. Dr. Ashwini, please. Ashwini, unmute yourself, please. Yes, sir. Now you can hear me? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yes. Ashwini, very well. This is very wonderful presentations by speakers in the... This, this field is uh, 
most of the ICRs don't know about this feature. This, this branch, especially pediatric ophthalmology and uh, description of glasses to the children. These the many concepts were clear today. I think my also was clear and other viewers must also have got a lot of knowledge from these topics. Because most of the time this, this concept, uh, pediatric ophthalmology, most of the eye surgeons they don't know or it is difficult even at, during MBBS also and, and during PG exam also, you are scared of the skin case. If, if, if anyone gets screened case, then he's likely to fail. So still that fear remains with us. Thank you. All Thank the you, speakers have this. Dr. Dinesh, let's have Thank your you, comments sir. a little. Thank you, sir. It was very nice. And uh, uh, all the new learning, from all the very nice speakers from all around the country and uh, especially International. <laughs> international uh, Dr. Samira, it was uh, good to hear her again. And uh, uh, I just uh, want to make a request, sir, if you allow, I have one, uh, I've just prepared one slide for the next uh, Sunday webinar. Uh, if you that's can. possible, if you that's can. possible, yeah, you please. Can. So that's a, a different kind of a uh, webinar, sir. Can I, in meantime? Uh, is my screen? Uh, visible? Yeah, yeah. It's coming up. Okay. So, what we are planning is uh, something which I have. Uh, titled as uh, different strokes because uh, I feel uh, this is a difficult time for ophthalmologists uh, uh, both medical legally as well as uh, financially and uh, in the year 2020 when we were expecting something else uh, now people are expecting 2020 vision but without paying a penny so we are really in stress, I feel, and uh, these two topics we have chosen, how to secure oneself medically legally and uh, how to secure oneself financially. And we have uh, Dr. Neeraj Nagpal, uh, Dr. Neelima's uh, uh, elder brother, and he is uh, a great authority on uh, medical legal issues with, uh, uh, he's convener of Medical Legal Action Group. <coughs> and we have Abhishek Luthra, who is uh, consultant in finance and investment. And we have a full power packed panel um, uh, starting from vice president of the AIUS then president IRSI, boss, HOS, LOS, and then secretary uh, AIUS, secretary boss, and members of the managing committee of AIUS and past members of the uh, managing committee AIOS. Dr. Neelima is already here and I expect uh, uh, you will be able to find some time uh, next Sunday morning uh, for this different kind of a webinar. I invite sure, all of you uh, I always invite all of you uh, to be there. Thanks a lot. Sir. Will, and, uh, we will be definitely is, there. And uh, now, can I request Shafi? Dr. Shafi Badwal is the youngest cornea surgeon we have with us. How, yes. do, how was your experience with it? It was really amazing, very productive, uh, especially the cornea talks as I'm a cornea surgeon. So I was more interested in the cornea part. They were really very helpful. Being in private practice now, so things have changed from Arvind to Ludhiana and Fortis. So... It was a great seminar. I mean, really. thank you. Dr. Ravinda, you would like to speak? Yeah. Uh, I say, uh, I must say, it was a very, very wonderful CME. And uh, it covered all the basic aspects about cornea and squint. And being a retinal surgeon, uh, I myself learned many new things. And many times we uh, definitely uh, miss certain basic points. If we all know that, we can refer the patients at the earliest stage. 
so uh, every speaker was excellent and all talks were wonderful i have learned many new things today it was of thank use you. to each and every ophthalmologist thank you thank you dr ravinder ravinder dr ravinder is a uh, senior metrorectal consultant mind you she has the patients who sit around how much patients she must be having doing it was very interesting it was very interesting to listen to all the cornea and the squint ravinder doctor neeraj no it is informative for uh, yeah. very important it is very important to know what you don't know and what you don't yes. do yes doctor neeraj i really enjoyed this uh, interactive session and uh, i'm sure uh, as me all of us will go home wiser and intelligent as well as as press squint and cornea is concerned it is wonderful very well organized and uh, thank you great pride Neeraj is our vice president of the Ludhiana Thermic Society. Now I have in the end, before I thank everyone, one little, uh, if I can get it. We we have two webinars which are coming at a national level. I hope I can share it. I think, sir, Dr. Dhami, sir, uh, I must congratulate okay. the Ludhiana Ophthalmological Society to, for conducting the maximum number of webinars in this COVID time. I think Ludhiana Ophthalmological Society am I coming? needs a big applause. Dr. Dhami yeah. is our torch bearer. You know. Yeah. I, uh, are you seeing my screen? Yes, sir. No, <clears> not this not screen as such. Yes, not able to see the screen. Yeah. Not able. Just hold on. Now. Yes. No, sir. No. Sir, we are seeing you. It's equally good. <laughs> uh, no, 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 no. I want to show you something else. Actually, we we have two webinars by the RSI, and okay. uh, it was my uh, suggestion at the national level. that we see what our young our youngsters doing to reshape the ophthalmology today so we have young turks as the title of the webinar one is for cataract and one is for refractive and all the youngsters from north and all over india will be presenting their work to the one of the most senior most panelists of the country one is on the 26th of june and the second day is on the 3rd of july please do save your dates we'll send you the full information and you'll see how throttling and energetic our next generation is they want to do what we thought we will do and they are doing what really what we were planning and very nice very nice i think we will really enjoy it and at the onset i will not forget this time to thank the whole organizers it is as healthcare private limited bangalore their team mr john mr chaku who made all this communication very simple and sitting at home very comfortable mr rohit mr jatin their support service is undoubtedly good and made this event a great success i really thank them and we all really do owe a little share extra to the farmer who have taken this us beyond i remember organizing a conference is not simple dr dinesh knows it i know it hotel booking hall booking what not what not and the audience is nil and now we have crossed over hundreds and hundreds plus audience in this webinar once again my thanks to all dr sumira thank you sparing so much of day so much of time dr himanshu can't forget you always you are in our family dr jyoti matalia my two consultants keep talking about you and i keep listening dr sachit has been to happens to do her fellowship under dr jyoti matalia and my daughter nimrata happens to be fond of dr himanshu she tells me he conduct doesn't conduct opd he teaches in opd and he communicates with the patient 
and teaches the same words to his fellows we are proud of you thank you very much thank you everyone thank you very thank much you. thanks a lot thank you sir thank you, thank you, thank you, you neelima thank you sir thanks a lot